It's time for Twit This Week in Tech. We have a great, smart panel for you. Tim Stevens is here from CNET, from Stratechery, Ben Thompson, my buddy Stephen Kovac from Tech Insider. And we're going to talk about the latest news. Yes, some CES news, autonomous vehicles, the future of the auto industry. But there's also watches and VR and all sorts of tech next on Twit. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twit. This Week in Tech, episode 545, recorded Sunday, January 17th, 2016. There's a literal frog in my throat. This Week in Tech is brought to you by ShipStation.com. When you're selling online, getting your orders out the door quickly can be tough. ShipStation.com is the fastest, easiest way to manage and ship all your orders in one place. For a free two-month trial, visit ShipStation.com. And before you do anything else, click the microphone, that little microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in TWIT. That's ShipStation.com. And enter TWIT. And by Carbonite. Keep your business safe this year. Protect files on your computer or server with automatic cloud backup from Carbonite. Try it free without a credit card at Carbonite.com today. And use the offer code TWIT to get two free bonus months if you decide to buy. And buy Squarespace. Squarespace is the simplest way to create a landing page or beautiful website for your portfolio, your blog, your business, your online store. Enter the offer code TWIT and get 10% off Squarespace. You should. And buy Headspace. Train your mind for a healthier, less stressed life. Download the free Headspace app and begin their Take 10 program for 10 days of guided meditation at headspace.com slash twit. It's time for Twit This Week in Tech, the show where we cover the week's tech news. Great panel for you. We brought in the heavy hitters, the smart guys. Start with Tim Stevens. He is from CNET, but also from a brand new publication on CNET. Uh, congratulations on the roadshow. Thank you, Leo. Yeah, we just launched that uh, at the Detroit Auto Show this week, uh, and it's been a great first week. We're really excited to have it out there in the wild and public eyes, finally. Timing couldn't be better. Everybody's very interested in autonomous vehicles, what's going on with cars. I mean, it really isn't. It's not uh, anymore, you know, you want a Corvette or a Mustang. It's really gotten to be a very interesting, almost a consumer electronics subject these days. Absolutely, yeah. We're seeing more and more studies that show that people are making um, buying decisions about cars more about what their phones can do with their yeah. cars than you know what's under the hood. So uh, yeah, we're trying to uh, trying to do our best to bring that information to to the readers. Well, somebody else who's very interested in all of this, uh, he joins us from Taiwan, Ben Thompson, of Stratechery.com and the Exponent FM podcast. Hey, Ben. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> good to see you. <laughs> How early <laughs> is it? Uh, it is seven a.m. Oh, it's not that bad. Do you, you normally get up at this hour, no doubt? Uh, <laughs> yes, like all bloggers do. <laughs> <laughs> bloggers love getting up, see the sunrise. Uh, it, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's better It's better now because during day and time, I have to wake up at 6. So, aye, or it starts aye, at 6, so aye, aye. winter's easier. Well, welcome. I'm so glad you make the time for us because uh, we really love your input. Also uh, joining us, and we're thrilled to have him, Steve Kovac. He is uh, from Business Insider, but he's now deputy editor of their newest publication, Tech Insider, techinsider.io. Last time you were here, you were just getting that started. It's going well? Yeah, we're, um, I think we're six months in now, and uh, yeah, we're, everything's chugging along. It's really impressive. We just finished our first CES, and now we're going to do some big things for our full, first full year out there. So I'm really excited. And it is a wide-ranging <laughs> You, well, the best pizza place in New York City. Here's what gravitational waves are and how they could change physics forever. And it's a mix of stuff. It's a mix. Lake Erie can get extremely violent, and here are the photos to prove it. The it's sexiest the, uh, doctor alive. It's really a wide ranging. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> so there's a lot of digital culture. That's what that Instagram doctor guy yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, I'm in charge of just the nuts and bolts gadget and app coverage, but. Uh, you know, we're pretty diversified and, you know, the whole idea here is to cover things. Uh, the broad theme of the site is innovation and and what 
technology enables to, us to do. And so that hot doctor wouldn't exist without Instagram. <laughs> you know? So That's true. Uh, so it's a kind of a different approach to technology journalism, I think. I was looking at iJustine's feed uh, the other day, and we love iJustine. Uh, she kind of got her start on this network, uh, she, you know, and uh, well, I've watched with great uh, pride and interest in her uh, success. But, um, man, I mean, it's interesting to watch her Instagram feed. The most recent one is her jumping in the air, and there are a lot of them like that. And I think 20,000 likes. Yeah, and it's immediately, a, too. Immediately. Yeah. Did, did you see the video of the, um, what was that, of the guy's notifications? I can't oh, yeah, and it just blows up his home screen? Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. And that's why if you're an Instagram star, you never turn on uh, lock screen notifications. Who? It just whizzes by. I'm going to have to see if I can uh, find that. I can't remember what he, he was a, it was a sports thing like NFL or something. Yeah, I forget how he was famous but uh we posted it on the site too i was just blown away by that i didn't know the iphone could do that yeah this is what eight million instagram followers does to your notifications um <laughs> take a look can you see me you can't see me you see me there we go look at that i didn't even know the iphone could do inst notifications that fast i love Great the casual like, put the t back down <laughs> <laughs> just watching my notifications flow in Wow. Those are all likes. Yeah. Chimney Christmas. Mm -hmm. So you did have a, a story that is more, probably more important than how many Instagram likes. By the way, it's a, it's a Demi Dezu who runs a soccer-focused Instagram account at 433 that I've never heard of, but if, I guess if you're a soccer or football fan, you would know. Uh, SpaceX uh, had a launch and an attempted landing today that failed, we should mention. Uh, they were trying to do what they had already done once before, which is land the second stage or the first stage. No, the second, anyway, one of the stages successfully so it could be reused. And unfortunately, in this case, um, the apparently one of the struts snapped. We weren't able to watch the video. The video feed from the barge failed. One of the struts. Yeah, they're going to put it up later, I think. Yeah. Uh, Musk said the residual pieces of the crash. Elon Musk, we're talking about the founder of SpaceX, are bigger this time compared to the first two similar landing attempts last year. But from the you know from the looks of it, at least some of us survived. Uh, and of course, this is important to SpaceX and to space in general because one of the big costs of launches is that these rockets are one-time use and they land in the sea and they're gone and they're very expensive uh, to build. It, the last failed landing that they had blew up rather spectacularly. It looks like this one just kind of so tumbled bad. over. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's that's an improvement. Yes. But, the, you know, the one success that they did have, have was on solid ground. They're still trying to do the uh, the drone ship landing thing successfully. They haven't managed to pull that off just yet. If they can do that, then they can do that in uh, in California, which is what they want to do. So um, we'll have to wait and see. But um, I guess it was somewhat rough seas today, which probably didn't help matters at all. Well, and also uh, there is a little bit of, vying uh, between Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk because Jeff Bezos is, was it Blue Orb, Blue Sky? Blue, Blue Origin. Blue Origin did successfully land one of its uh, stages. And so there's, you know, this is kind of, they're measuring. It's okay. A little competition <laughs> is good in civilian space. Actually, we talked yesterday on the new screensavers. Jason Calacanis was uh, my co-host about Elon's plan to provide global internet with some huge number of low Earth orbit satellites. And uh, he had to, he, Jason pointed out, well, one of the reasons he can even contemplate this is he happens to own a rocket company. So, <laughs> so maybe there is a, some sense in launching uh, this. What was it? How many was it? Was it 400, 500 low Earth orbit? All right, let's get, uh, let's get uh, back to uh, the topic at hand. You didn't go to CES. Tim was at CES. Ben, you didn't go to CES. I was there. Were you? I was very happy. Yeah. Uh, I, no, I was very happy staying here in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, you got. You, sorry. You got Computex. You got other stuff to do. But you. You uh, went. You went, Steve. Yeah. Actually, I saw Tim there at the Faraday Future um, keynote thing. Faraday is one of the electric cars. Kind of a new one in the in the business. And they showed off a concept car. How Bat Batmobile. <laughs> what? Batmobile. Homework, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. Where, where Faraday has yet to actually show any real product, right? But are they? Right. What do you think, Tim? Are they credible? 
Uh, they've definitely got a lot of funding. That was one of the big things that they talked about at the event at CES was their, their backing from LETV, which is a, a major Chinese a media conglomerate worth billions of dollars. Uh, they've invested somewhere around a billion dollars to get um, this company, Fair Day Future, off the ground. Um, so they definitely got some strong backing and they have started, uh, they're about to start construction on a battery factory just outside of Las Vegas. So that was another part of the big announcement they're making at CES. Um, but, you know, the big thing that we wanted to see was some kind of a production based car or something that would be, you know, that we could actually see and sit in and get driven around in and actually, you know, track the, the course of this company towards some kind of a, a product that you and I can actually think about buying. But instead, they rolled out this crazy concept car thing, an autonomous thousand horsepower, four wheel drive, electric hypercar thing, uh, which was, you know, just a hollow shell, certainly nothing that would ever go into production. And that was pretty disappointing because, you know, Everyone can draw cool sketches and have lots of fun, but uh, to, to actually make a production ready car that can pass all the crash regulations and everything else that you need to get on the road, that's a much more complicated thing. And, and so that's still a big question mark in my mind and, and in a lot of other people's minds as well. Yeah, when you go to these websites, and Faraday Future is a really classic one, and it's very airy, fairy, blue sky. What if we could redefine our relationship with the automobile? I always makes me a little, mm. a little suspect of the whole thing, but they got money. They got venture capital. You uh, you wrote it recently, actually, Ben, uh, your most recent post on Stratechery was about uh, autonomous vehicles. Ben would love to respond, but we've had to... We uh, lost him. Yeah. <laughs> We're rebooting his computer right ah, now. I should have looked over and noted that. All right, we'll, we'll get John, Ben. John is we'll writing you a ben note back. right now to say yeah. Ben is lost. Ben is lost. <laughs> He's lost to us. Well, let's talk about the Detroit Auto Show, because that's one of the things that you see at uh, CES uh, is, of course, the consumer electronics aspect of automobiles, the, uh, you know, the, the high tech inside. Is it the same at the Detroit Auto Show these days or is it more traditional? It's definitely more traditional. Uh, we're seeing CES become the platform for these major manufacturers to make big announcements about their their consumer electronics integrations, uh, CarPlay announcements. GM announced their five hundred million dollar investment in Lyft, for example. Um, those are stories that really wouldn't play as well in Detroit. You know, Detroit's a traditional automotive right. show uh, with a lot of traditional automotive journalists there. They want to see new cars. They want to see new sheet metal. Talk about new engines, that kind of thing. Uh, so you know, partnerships with, with Silicon Valley and infotainment integrations and things like that just really would kind of get buried amongst all the noise of the new models being unveiled in Detroit. Um, so, you know, we're seeing GM and Ford and other manufacturers have kind of a, a smart cadence. So they'll go to CES, they'll talk about their technology stories, they'll talk that up, and they'll get a good buzz going into Detroit where they'll show off the actual cars. So, and Mercedes did that very well this year as well. They showed off the E-Type in at CES. They did some uh, some demonstrations of the autonomous functionality or the self-driving functionality of that car. Uh, and then you get to Detroit and you actually see the car itself. So that was yeah. um, a, a nice way to transition from one show to the next. I love it. Corning was there with Gorilla Glass for car windshields. They showed it on the Ford GT. Right, and uh, Ryan Seacrest was there for the demonstrations of, uh, well, he was there talking at the uh, the Ford event, and then he went to the Ford booth, and uh, people got to shoot uh, hails at, hailstones at him through oh, uh, nice. oh, through yeah. glass. I should have gone. gone Darn. Gone, <laughs> yeah. gone, 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 we, we actually got a video gone. of that, and it was pretty, um, gone, definitely gone. pretty exciting. <laughs> okay, calm, calm down. Uh, I What's think. What's going on there? <laughs> God, 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 <laughs> Steve God, Kovac God, God. has really lost it. No, we have another Skype down. <laughs> so, Tim, it's just going to be you and me, I think. It sounds lovely, God, Leo. God, I can't, God. Uh, can't imagine anything better. <laughs> we can survive this. Um, and, but this is, you know what? There is a moral to be told here, which is the more you have consumer electronics in a car, the more you risk crashes. And I don't mean physical crashes, but software crashes. And that's one of the reasons I think car manufacturers are a little bit, and rightly so, skeptical of turning these things into computers. Yeah, there's definitely, you know, there has to be a line drawn and, you know, firewalls built and all that good stuff yeah. to make sure that... Uh, they haven't done a good job of that, according to... That kind of thing. Yeah. Would, would not cause, uh, yeah. Kind of and that's definitely one of the things that, that we talked a bit about. In fact, General Motors just launched a, a cybersecurity division within the company about, I think, eight or nine months ago. Um, so they actually have a team of somewhere between 80 and 100 individuals working at GM focused exclusively on security. And some of them are, you know, half the team's trying to break stuff. The other half's trying to fix stuff. Yeah. Uh, but it's good to see that the corporations are making that level 
level of interest. And, uh, you know, they are still not exactly clear on exactly how the software is structured to provide the internal security that you need for these sorts of systems. They're trying to, you know, not being totally transparent or as open as you might expect uh, someone like Google to be, for example. But, but they are being a little bit more transparent and they're learning, I think, that um, that security through obscurity is, is not the way forward, which yeah. which for me was quite quite encouraging to learn. Uh, you talk a little bit about uh, Audi is doing a hydrogen-fueled, it's a concept car, but this is a different kind of electric car. Right. So, you know, your, your typical EV, your Tesla, that kind of thing has electric motors powering the wheels and then the electricity comes from a battery. Uh, a hydrogen powered car is actually pretty much the same thing, except the battery pack is a lot smaller uh, and there is an additional hydrogen tank on board plus a fuel cell stack. So instead of the electric electricity coming exclusively from the battery, the electricity can come through this fuel cell stack, which is powered by hydrogen. Uh, the only emissions from the car would be basically water, uh, which is you know, not that bad for the environment. Uh, and you get um, much quicker refueling. You can refuel a fuel cell powered car in about four minutes. So, you know, roughly the same time as you can refuel a gasoline powered car. Uh, and again, you can have all the range of a gas powered car and all the power and everything else too. Uh, the, the problem of course is you can't go to your local corner gas station and get a tank full of hydrogen, at least not yet. Um, but yet both, um, well, Audi had the H-Tron car there, which is pretty cool. It also has some kind of fancy high-tech stuff like pop-out chrome mirrors and the fenders. Instead of having actual mirrors, they're just digital cameras that point backwards, which is nice. I think Much that's really that. interesting. We've seen other cars doing that, too. With a, with yeah. a, uh, a re Who was it that had a rear-view mirror that was just a camera view? What a great idea. Um, Chevy's actually replaced Chevy. or has augmented the bolt, that was the bolt. The bolt yeah. a rear view mirror with a camera. So that gives a 120 degree wide angle view at the rear rather than just using a mirror. But in the U.S., you cannot actually get rid of at least the driver's side mirror it has to be a proper mirror. So a digital uh, rear view mirrors, which uh, are much more aerodynamic than things hanging off your door. Uh, are not legal in the U.S. yet. That's something that manufacturers are trying to change. Uh, but Chevy kind of got around that by building the mirror into an LCD panel that sits behind the actual mirror. So if the <laughs> LCD were to go out for any reason, it works just like an old school mirror. But when you flip on the system, you get the digital camera view at the back, which is a pretty smart way to, to get, get around the legislation, as it were. Is, is that the concern of legislators? Uh, is safety that, the, that a, a video tap might not be as reliable as a physical mirror? I think that's part of what why that law still exists, but ultimately it, it, it exists because back in the day there simply was no alternative and they wanted right. to le legislate that there had to be a mirror, so they simply stated that a oh, I physical see. mirror had to be on the car. It wasn't uh, to so prevent ca uh, cameras, it was because there weren't any, there wasn't right. anything like that. Yeah, And that's one of these things that's getting really unfortunately confusing as manufacturers are trying to go forward with autonomous right. functionality. Um, BMW, for example, in Europe you could park your new 7 Series by getting out of the car and hitting a button on the remote control, the car would then pull itself into your garage and you wouldn't have to do anything. But in the U.S., BMW did, uh, disabled that functionality because the law in certain states in the U.S. says that you must, to put the car into park, you must physically depress the brake pedal before putting it into park. And BMW said, well, you can't do that if you're not in the car, so therefore we have to disable that functionality. Uh, but of course, Tesla added that functionality just a couple of weeks ago, and, and the new E-Class from Mercedes will do the same thing. They took the interpretation that the brake pedal simply had to be pressed. It didn't matter how it was pressed. Uh, and that's one of those annoying kind of things where it's up for interpretation, and different manufacturers are interpreting it in different ways. And that's one of the reasons that we saw the U.S. Uh, Department of Transportation making a big statement just last week that uh, they're going to try to work to standardize a lot of these laws and everything to make the U.S. a more friendly place for autonomous Good. research and things like that, which is Good. which is very encouraging. Yeah, Tesla also announced a fetch mode where you can actually say to your car, park in the garage, and the car parks itself, and then you go out your front door and say, come here, car, and it comes and gets you when you're the next day. Yeah, which is great if your garage has just enough room to fit a car and, and nothing else. Uh, that certainly, you know, means you won't have to spend much time cleaning your garage. But certainly, you know, it'll make cars easier to park. Well, that's really um, interesting. Is it reliable? Yeah. Have you tried it? We haven't had a chance to try it yet, no, um, but uh, BMW and Mercedes-Benz both have similar functionality. So weird. The Mercedes app, uh, is it, is it, part of this also is that you always must uh, maintain control of the car to be, you know, basically, well, to show that you are in control of the car, to be driving the car. And that was another part of the legislation that BMW was concerned about. The way that Mercedes is getting around that is you run an app on your smartphone, and so as you're backing up your car, you have to run your finger in a circle <laughs> on the app to basically continue I'm to make control. the car move. I'm in control. So if you take your finger off the app, the car stops immediately. That way you're demonstrating control of the car without actually physically being in the car. That's some form uh, of driving. These, these silly games and things I'm like that. I'm in control. Watch. Yeah.
<laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah, actually, I the uh, the only time I've used any autonomous functions, I was at the Ford test track. This is some years ago. We actually, unfortunately, have this on camera. Uh, and they were demonstrating their self-park feature. And they said, okay, you're driving through town. Thank goodness this is on the test track. I And I was in a big old flex. And they said, mm -hmm. okay, you're looking for a parking space. So press that button. The car continues. You continue to drive. And then it beeps at you. Oh, here's a spot I could fit. It's a big car, so that's good. And then you said, okay. They said, go park it. And so I pressed the other button, and they say, take your hands off the wheels, your feet off the pedals, it's going to park itself. In the it's cool, the thing spins around and stuff. Yeah. What they don't tell you, and I think they did it on purpose, is, and maybe now that there's a whole, now I'm, now I'm thinking there's a whole, there was a whole plan here, is mm -hmm. once it parks, put your feet back on the brake and turn off the ignition, because I didn't, and it continued to idle backwards into the car behind me and went, bam. <laughs> And now I'm thinking, oh, they were trying to, they do this because there were engineers in this car laughing at me. I think this is their way of lobbying state legislatures to take that rule off that you have to have somebody with a, to put a foot on the brake. Because it should just say, I'm parked. Yeah, absolutely. Especially now that you don't have to have any physical linkage between yourself and the transmission. The, the right. you know, transmissions can shift themselves. Cars can steer themselves yeah. now. There's no more mechanical. I'm driving by wire cars. anyway. Oh. Yeah. Absolutely. So there's a lot of old laws hanging around that, that ultimately are, are making making these engineering decisions more difficult than they need to be. And, and that's part of what, what that program from the DOT is is going Good. to try to go through to iron out all these. Like you can test autonomous cars in four states in the U.S. right now. And I think Virginia is coming on will be number five. But that's it. You know, there are certainly a lot of places and a lot of opportunities to be testing these cars in other states in the U.S. And if you have to pick and choose like that, it's going to make it more difficult to be a leader in that area. And autonomy is, you know, is going to be a huge industry for these auto manufacturers and if they can't test these things efficiently in every state in the u.s that's going to be a major issue for them going forward so um, you know I, I hope that this really helps to to have a stable platform across the u.s for laws that are progressive enough to enable this kind of technology and to enable us to continue to be leaders in the automotive space and thompson you wrote about this in stratechery in fact you said that for your money the most interesting news out of ces was from general motors yeah, sorry, I got disconnected. So yeah, I'm, we got I'm, you back. I apologize if no I uh, re recover any points, but um, well, I think I mean that that was that was a, a nice a nice hook. I think the uh, the um, I'm I'm personally a little skeptical about the bolt um, specifically. Uh, I think the you know the challenge when it comes to uh, low cost electric is uh, the the what you're buying as a someone buying a thirty thousand dollar car is very different than what you're looking for in in a purchase in a you know you mentioned that you were you were uh, acquiring a tesla in in, in a hundred thousand dollar car a ninety thousand dollar car yeah um particularly Why? today is it because well, it's more expensive to do it right well first off the up i mean the upfront cost is 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 going to be more uh and uh, there's plenty of evidence that customers anchor on on the upfront cost more more than the total cost of ownership um, two, the total cost of ownership of an internal combustion engine powered car right now is, is as low as it's been in a long time. And it's going to be for, and it looks like it's to be that way for a while because of low oil prices. Um, and then three, I think an, an, an underappreciated part is, uh, people who are buying a, a Tesla, um, if they want to go to grandma's house, they can say, oh, we'll just take the BMW instead. Right. <laughs> um, Whereas someone buying a someone buying a thirty thousand dollar car right. with subsidies, they got the uh, one. They probably don't have an alternative car. Two, they're definitely not going to fly. Right? They can't drop, you know, twenty five hundred dollars on on the full whole family to get plane tickets. Um, and so the 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 pure driving performance issue, aka range of electrics, is much more of a of a limiting factor. I think for the lower you go on the income scale. Um, on the flip side, the Bolt's not going to really, unless it gets like some sort of Prius aura, confer some sort of like status on you that no question having a Tesla does. You only need to, you know, go down. That's why I'm buying it. I just want clearly. the status. I don't really care. <laughs> I, well, I mean, it, you, you say, no, you, you know what that, I want? You, you, know say what? That, you say that with a smirking tone to hide the truth. Yes, which uh, is that which I is, do. Which is, is that that's totally the case. No, I, um, you know, you know why I want a Tesla? Because I want the highest tech. Uh, vehicle out there just to try it, just to see. I'm, I actually was very tempted with the Bolt. I thought that looked pretty good. 200 mile range. Tesla's not hugely more. I think it's 350. 
Sure, but selling to people who are interested in the tech just to try it isn't a particularly large market. No, no, market. that's not. It's just a small, tiny market. <laughs> so, tiny, um, I grant you that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, this is a very narrow point, but I, I'm, I, I guess I'm, I'm no, no auto expert like, like, like Tim or, or anyone else in the space, but I think just looking at kind of the market, the characteristics of the market for a car like the Bolt, um, We'll see. We'll see. I think big picture. I think that what I was trying to do with my piece this week was was really everyone talks about cars are changing. There's cars in the news constantly, but there's really very distinct axes that it's changing on. And I think uh, your kind of interpretation of what's happening varies based on what you look at. The three being you know the electrification, um, number two being self driving, number three being uh, the changing nature of transportation, which is from individually owned and operated vehicles to right. to transportation as a service. And that like may throw everything up in the air because, uh, you know, these cars, these companies are built around the notion of private personal car ownership. Well, I thought it was very interesting, as you point out, that uh, as well as announcing the Bolt, GM announced a half billion dollar investment in Lyft. And you right. don't invest in Lyft as a ride service you're not buying a taxi company you're buying it's not really about ride sharing it's in my opinion both uber and lyft are really about the future of car ownership and they're hedging their bets in effect right well, well i mean the, the, i mean frankly uh if if tra if transportation as a service becomes the dominant form of transportation i mean all the existing car manufacturers are are in trouble not because we won't need cars we will uh but because the nature of what we need a car for will change um, How does it change their business? Is uh, I actually haven't really. I'm sure you've crunched the numbers. Are do they sell a lot fewer cars because we're not all owning individual mm, owning? Not cars? necessarily because it, I mean, if the number, it, it, it's hard to know how the number of 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 miles driven will change. But I mean, presumably, if we are all using Ubers and Lyfts in the future, uh, the cars that are used for Uber and Lyft are going to need to be replaced far more frequently. I mean, just the wear and tear is going to so be so. It's, it's still a higher. business for them. Right, but the difference is you're not buying a ninety thousand dollar car because it makes you feel good about yourself. Yeah, and you can it's all fleet really purchases. For the environment. Yeah, right. Actually, exactly. I spoke with um, I spoke with Mark Fields, who's the CEO of Ford in Detroit this past week, and you know everyone's asking that question. You know, is Ford basically is Ford screwed if everyone just goes into car sharing and stops buying cars? And his response was pretty interesting, which I'd i never heard before. He says that the personal transportation industry, i.e. the car industry, is about a two point something trillion dollar industry. Um, but he said the mass transportation industry uh, is of something like a five point something trillion dollar industry. And right now, the auto industry has no share of that whatsoever. And he said, worst case, if they need to transition to being something more of a mass transit, you know, something more of a not quite an authority, but in that area, um, that's actually a huge new market for them to tap into. Obviously, it's going to take a lot of change for them to be able to capitalize on that. But with that investment from GM in, into Lyft and with Ford's smart mobility program, they're definitely looking in that direction and they see you know, they see the writing as much as anybody. And, and Mark Fields at least is confident that they can pivot in that direction. Of course he would be, but, um, but that was an interesting angle I thought of, uh, of that attack on that problem. Well, and you know, I, yeah, I of, also of, been course, talking, of course he would be being the, uh, the CEO the, sure. the most yeah. important state. Yeah, of course. But, but I, no, I've also been talking to Ford since before, uh, Mark to Alan Mulally, as I know you have, and it's mm -hmm. really, they have been fairly aware of this. And it, by the way, these are the exact changes we've seen technology, uh, the havoc technology has wreaked on a lot of industries, but this is a giant industry and a well, huge the, economic driver in the United States. So I think there's a lot, you know, there's concern about what this might portend. Well, that's something well, that's interesting. Reason. What Faraday Future has told has uh, told our, our reporter um, a couple weeks ago, they don't see it like the, in the long term view, you know, in the short term, in four or five years, they'll have a car that you can buy. It'll be like another Tesla type thing. But 10, 15, 20 years, they're going for that services thing, too. They see it as like a subscription service. You pay a fee and they deliver you whatever car when you need it. So if you need a truck to you know, pick up furniture from Ikea, you get that. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you need um, you know, just a one-man vehicle just to get you to work for the day, you get that. And that's what comes to you. So it's kind of like uh, – almost like Spotify, but for cars, you know, you get the thing that you need when I, you need it and I then do, you don't own the car. I do have to think that that reduces the amount of sales because really there are a lot of cars in this country that are not being driven. I mean, that's how Uber X and Lyft started was this notion. There's a lot of cars just sitting around <laughs> because, uh, you know, people drive to work and then the other cars sit in the garage or whatever. Yeah, I, have well, quite I mean, a few people it's, who, it's who are, 
who are not going where they want to or who are going where they want to in a way that they would rather not. Um, you know, there are certainly people who are unable to drive anymore and who are relying on public that transit. I can't wait for. Yeah. Who, who I want to just... And, you know, people who are younger than 16 who want to be able right. to get somewhere or parents of people who are younger than 16 who want to have their kids get to school uh, without or the band practice or whatever. You no, know, I think it's just a matter of time before they invent a. Uh, 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 a thing that you, as long as you're playing Candy Crush Saga, the car continues to move forward. <laughs> and and I think that you're that's actually, right. yeah, that's actually the solution right there. Mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry, I'm being facetious. Well, this is exactly why I think it's useful though, to tease these things apart because uh, it's it's trivial to sit here and imagine what the future will look like. The, the real trick in analysis, particularly when it comes to anything technology related, is figuring out the timing. Um, so yeah, maybe one day I can order whatever car I want to my door and come up. But uh, as much as Faraday wants to brag about their funding, I like to see the funding that guarantees they'll get to that date and they'll be in place to do it. Um, color me pretty skeptical. Uh, I'm totally skeptical. The, too, I'm with you. Well, the the, the 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 and this is where it gets into. I mean, uh, you know, something that has has gotten criticism over the last couple of years, as and uh, in part from me. Um, but is the idea of, of disruption. But I think it's actually a very useful thing to think about in, in this case in that um, when it comes to electrification, for example, or these uh, fetch my car for, or park in my garage, the things you were talking about earlier, I mean, these are very much uh, sustaining sort of innovations in which, in which case we should expect the existing manufacturers to take advantage of them. And if you want to enter the market, you're likely you're going to have to take a tactic like Tesla, where Tesla is coming at the high end. They're offering something. They're they're going over the top on features. They're going over the top on status and brand. And really, that's you know there, there's a reason why there have been very few new entrants into the car market over the last hundred years because it's it's a, it's a hard thing to break into. Um, on on the flip side, uh, disruption is not about people use the word disruption for everything, right? But it, it, disruption is about business models, first and foremost. And what happens with something like, like an Uber, where you no longer buy a car, you just use one when you need it, uh, that is a new business model. And what is scary about disruption is it doesn't matter that Mark Fields can see it coming. It doesn't matter that GM can see it coming. What will happen to them will be almost completely out of their control. And maybe they will survive in some fashion or maybe they won't or maybe it won't happen at all. But the entire point of disruption and what kind of makes it ironic uh, is that the, the brilliant insight of disruption is that incumbents can't really do anything about it. Right. And then now there's a whole consulting practice on helping incumbent companies deal with disruption. Right. Which should. Um, and we have you, such uh, a template for this. We've seen it happen so many times in so many industries. Well, I mean, what happens is once you get to a world where people don't buy their own cars, they're all fleet sales. Like, I'm sorry, but Ford, it, you innovate all you want, but your business has fundamentally changed right. and almost certainly in a less favorable direction because you're giving up all the angles on which you sell differentiated cars. Who's going to buy undercoating if it's fleet purchases? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of stuff like that. I mean, right. now, now, again, th there's a timing issue here. I mean, it's very easy to say that, oh, you know, the U.S. sold a record number of cars last year, 17.5 billion cars. That's 17.5 billion new reasons to not take an Uber. Um, so by no means the timing is clear. But what makes Uber particularly interesting from my perspective is that Uber uses today's cars with today's driving systems, a.k.a. humans. And, and like everything about Uber uses today's existing technologies, but with tomorrow's business model. And so that's interesting because as these technologies come online, like Uber is actually very well placed to acquire them or build them themselves, all these sorts of things. People want to talk about Google and all this sort of thing. Google is going for this, this home run, multi-bank shot approach where magically their system will work, it will be regulatory approved and people will accept it all at the same time. And that's not usually how technology change happens. Uh, and, uh, and so we'll see. I mean, I, I'm... You see the younger generation. I mean, the, the the analogy I made was to TV. What happened? People have been predicting cord cutting for ages, and it hasn't happened because people like their cable bundle. And there's lots of reasons for that. There's very good reasons for that. However, the numbers are going down finally. But the reason they're going down is not to be morbid, but people are dying, and young people are not getting it for the first time. They're just, they've grown up with tablets and the internet and all these sorts of things. And I suspect the same thing will happen with cars. 
uh, us old people are attached to our cars. We're going to stick with them till we die, probably in a car. Um, and young people are going to come up who the idea of wasting a couple hours a day on anything other than their smartphone will make no sense to them. And that's when the shift will happen. Sorry, that was a long rant. No, I think I, it's a, it's exactly to the point because we're trying to figure out what the heck's going to happen. We're in a really weird interregnum where gas prices are going down, down, down. There's a gas glut and car sales are rec at record highs. But you know that that's, that's not going to stay that way. Well, th there's lots of actually reasons to suspect that they will. Really? I mean, th there's been a massive technological breakthrough in, in oil extraction, which is fracking. I mean, and it is it has lowered the cost. It's opened up massive new resources for oil, which are not in, you know, despot controlled countries. Uh, it is it comes online and goes offline quickly. So it responds relatively quickly to market conditions. Um, and yeah, I think there's 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 secular reasons to expect that oil will stay lower for the for 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 a while wow. um which which again but that's fine i mean the thing about electrification is it, it's interesting it's a new technology it theoretically allows some new companies to come in because you're removing the complexity of the drivetrain but it's not changing the fundamental nature of what it means to have a car company and what it means to own a car uh it's just it, it looks it's, like i picked a crappy time to uh Give up the grid and uh, buy an electric car. <laughs> no, <laughs> Put no, solar just, panels on my house. Hey, you're doing good for the environment. Oh, that's right. That's why I'm doing it. Yeah. Tim Stevens is here. You picked a good time to create a new show, Road Show, part of his uh, CNET duties. Uh, and it's, what is the uh, website? Road sh the Road Show? Uh, the Roadshow .com. That's dot right. Com. Yeah, it's uh, lots of reviews and videos and lots of other good stuff. Nice. Ben Thompson from Stratechery, if you could see by now, if you've didn't know it already that that is a must subscribe stratechery.com and uh, from techinsider.io brand new publication from business insider it's great to have steve uh, kofak we're i think i want to talk a little bit about bitcoin when we come back uh there's lots to talk about as always this week our show today brought to you by ship station we know a lot of you have uh, made hay in this new economy by uh, selling online by becoming an eBay seller or selling on Etsy or Amazon. But how do you ship? How do you do your fulfillment? You need to know about ShipStation.com, the fastest, easiest way to manage and ship all your orders in one place. ShipStation.com. They can easily create shipping labels for all the top carriers, including, of course, UPS and FedEx. Plus, you'll get a free U.S. Postal Service account that gives you access to deeply discounted USPS shipping rates. Those same rates that uh, in the past only Fortune 500 companies could get. You ship internationally? Sure, they do a DHL. They got it all in one spot. And it's really easy to import your customer orders from eBay, from Amazon, from Etsy, in fact, from more than 50 popular marketplaces and shopping carts. So it integrates right into your workflow. And no wonder it's the number one choice of online sellers. They have an incredible 98% satisfaction rating from their customers it's the way to ship you look pro your customers are happy you're happy your life is easier and you could try it free for the next 30 days in fact you can get an additional month for free if you use our offer code twit that's right 30 days free and another month free but you have to use the offer code twit now here's how you do it you go to shipstation.com there's a microphone at the top there you see it the little one Click that and enter the offer code TWIT. A free 30 day trial plus a free bonus month just for using the offer code TWIT at shipstation.com. Yay! I love empowering people to, um, to kind of make their way in this new economy. And just be glad you're not a big three automaker in the US. Then you don't have to figure this stuff out. I'd hate to be in that position. Uh, where the world is changing out from under you. And the, and the history is that even though companies know this is coming, that they often uh, can't figure out how to make the transition. I, I do think there's an aspect where, uh, <clears throat> you know, I use the Ernest Hemingway quote in my article, which is- I been love kind of that quote. I know it's been overused lately. It's getting overexposed. Uh, but, you know, how did you go bankrupt suddenly then grad or two ways suddenly then grad or gradually then suddenly? 
Um, boy, that was a, that was a rough three minutes for me. <laughs> um, but I, I do. It's think, such a good quote, think, though. I didn't know it was Ernest it Hemingway. But how did you go bankrupt? Two ways: gradually, then suddenly. I, I do think there will be an aspect of that in autos, and frankly, in a lot of businesses. I mean, I think yeah. I've been saying this will be the case for TV for a long time as well. I think people, it, it's so people get so hung up on the technology, and you can see why a future makes more sense than the present. And you can see that in TV where over the top video makes more sense. You can see it in, in cars where having these, you know, autonomous cars that just drive around ferrying people around on demand makes more sense for all kinds of reasons. Uh, but I think a mistake that technologists in particular make regularly is uh, dramatically underestimating how difficult it is to, to for that sort of change to happen. Um, I mean, you see this in technological products. People are hesitant to change how they use a computer, mm -hmm. much less how they use a car or the fact they, they have $50,000 sitting in their garage or, um, you know, how all these sorts of things. And and I think that, and so that's why I mentioned before, it's going to be a generational sort of sort of thing. Um, and so in the, in the medium term, short to medium term, I suspect actually most car companies are going to continue to, you know, to do better than we expect. Um, and so that's why, I mean, that's why I don't, that's why I don't do, do stock picking for, for example. Yeah. Well, one, if I did, I would do it for my own profit. <laughs> um, but two, uh, this is what makes it tricky is getting into the, the timing, the timing aspect of, of when this is going to come along. And the other thing too, I mean, this is why the Apple car, I think, uh, you know, it's easy to sit here and say like the Apple car makes no sense because we're all going to be in an Uber one day. Well, um, that's like saying in 2001 that building an iPod makes no sense because we're all going to be using our phones one day. Like that doesn't mean Apple shouldn't have made the iPod, for example. Um, you know, if, if we actually still have 20 to 25 years of this paradigm, I have no idea. I just threw that number out there. Then, you know, making something at the high end maybe is not the worst idea. Then again, if the paradigm is going to change in five years, it's, it's a terrible idea. And this is where... I and mean, this is why you get paid the big bucks to be, you know, Tim Cook or whoever to 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 make these sort of bets. It's interesting because you have on the one hand the incumbents, the Fords of the world trying to figure out how to survive. And you have the new guys trying to figure out how to capitalize. Here's Steve Kovac riding 85 miles an hour in a golf cart. You know, we just don't know what's what is this? The Arcomoto? Arcomoto. It's a uh, street legal trike. That's legal? Street, street legal. It's actually classified as a motorcycle. Wow. And it's all electric. It can uh, crank up to, I think, 80 or 85. I forget what the top. Yeah, 85, I guess it is. And, like, these guys told me something really profound, though, the, the founders of this company, when I was chatting with them, you know, in between takes on this thing. <laughs> you, look, they, you look good in that. <laughs> yeah, they, well, they said once, if and when we do get to fully autonomous uh, vehicles, the vehicles are going to look more like that thing I'm, right. I'm riding around in and less like a right. Model X or a Model S or a giant SUV because they don't need to withstand the impact from a tree right. or a bus mm -hmm. or something because that's not going to be an issue anymore. So vehicles get lighter. They get cheaper. They get um, more people uh, have access to uh, this kind of transportation. And like it's a win for everyone. Now, does that mean uh, – uh, the companies are going to make as much money off it? Probably not. Are they going to be able to sell a $100,000 Tesla anymore? Probably not. But it was just really interesting to think that, you know, in 20 or 30 years, our cars are going to look more like that and less like, uh, you know, a typical four-door sedan or something. We've seen uh, 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 autonomous urban uh, vehicles. Chevy had one a couple of years ago at CES. I'm sure, Tim, you, Tim you've seen more than that. They look like yeah. just little, little personal capsules almost. But I definitely would disagree with the, the notion that we won't have luxury cars in the future. I mean, we have luxury everything yeah. now. Uh, it, it doesn't, you know, we have luxury watches that cost more than right. more than cars, uh, and you know, you don't really need a watch anymore. Um, those things will definitely continue. And you know, I have a lot of issues with uh, Arkimoto. They've they've had some interesting practices. They've been delayed many many times. Uh, that's not um, that's a company that's um, got some interesting history there. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But yeah, definitely <laughs> once once cars can avoid accidents better than we can, yeah. We we can strip out a lot of the extraneous stuff in there and we can get rid of things like speed limits and you know uh driving licenses even at some point we won't even need we won't even need those right uh, but you know as we try to chart the future of the the, the car sharing economy somebody's still got to build those cars and uh, you know no one's better position than than the, the big auto manufacturers at this point so if anything we could we could 
make uh, transportation something that's accessible to more and more people, that doesn't necessarily mean that these companies are going to go away. That their business is going to shift drastically. I think they all appreciate that, um, but doesn't mean they're going to go away by any means. Let's talk a little bit about uh, Bitcoin. Mike Hearn, who was an early uh, uh, mover in uh, Bitcoin, I think I'm trying to think. I think he left his job at uh, Google to uh, go to work for about five years ago as a Bitcoin developer. Wrote an article that caused the price of Bitcoin to tumble three days ago on Medium, the resolution of the Bitcoin experiment, in which he says, I've sold all my Bitcoins, and I think I have come to the inescapable conclusion that it has failed. Bitcoin is over. He says the network is on the brinks of, brink of technical collapse. He should know that. But he, he's, he sets these six points. He says, think about it. If you'd never heard about Bitcoin before, would you care about a payments network that, one, couldn't move your existing money, two, had wildly unpredictable fees that were high and rising fast, three, allowed buyers to take back payments they'd made after walking out of the store just by pressing a button. He says, if you aren't aware of this feature, that's because Bitcoin was only just changed to allow it. And I think that was in response to large backlogs of Bitcoin transactions, sometimes taking a full day, and much of the Bitcoin mining now occurring in China, Jason Calacanis told me he, he believed that was because a lot of the Bitcoin miners were kind of in power plants and coal plants and nuclear plants in China where they could get tap into the electricity for free and avoid the real cost of Bitcoin mining, which is the cost of the electricity. And finally, in which the companies and people building it were in open civil war. Fred Wilson, avc.com, wrote a response in which he said, well, it's just an opportunity for Bitcoin to, you know, transform itself and survive. What do you guys, uh, what do you think the future is of Bitcoin? Ben, you probably I've, covered this. I've never seen Bitcoin as oh, a Steve, real currency. Bro. Yeah. No, it's, 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 a, it's an experiment. It's a commodity. It's a commodity. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, people trade it like a commodity. The fact that this guy wrote a Medium post and it sent the price tanking. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you don't see that with the dollars. I mean, right. if you can blog and change the value of the U.S. dollar, that's insane. Yeah. Um, there's no army backing it. There's no government backing it. Like they said, the fees and and, and transactions uh, processes are just like all over the map. Um, and I just have never seen a convincing argument from all these people um, in Silicon Valley investing in these technologies uh, that convinces me this can be a real currency. Um, well, so I, I think I that's that's. Guy. Well, that's that's actually kind of the the rub here is uh, I can't speak for most people in Silicon Valley. I can speak for uh, I, I know where a few of them stand, including myself. And, and I think that the value of Bitcoin actually is more interesting the less you think of it as currency. Um, what, what at a very fundamental level, what Bitcoin and and the blockchain type technology allows is digital scarcity, right? The, the entire thing with with digital is that it's infinitely copyable, and that's interesting in some ways, but it's problematic in other in other ways um, because you know the value of something digital immediately goes to zero because there's there's an effectively infinite amount. Well, in the case of of the blockchain, like you can actually have something be digital, and all the advantages that comes with that being instantly transferable. Uh, you know, transparent, movable all over the place, while also being scarce. Like there's, there can only be one of something, and that's like that was thought to be impossible. And what makes Bitcoin so interesting is that that made that made that possible. Um, now that has all kinds of potential interesting applications. The most obvious one of which is to be used as a currency. And the way Bitcoin specifically works is a series of of checks and balance, not checks and balances, but it, but interlocking incentives in which there has to be a monetary aspect to motivate miners to verify transactions, which enables the scarcity. And so there, there has to be a, a, a component of that to it. Um, but a, a real open question is um, with Bitcoin specifically, is the future as this sort of restricted amount of digital currency like gold which is why there tends to be an overlap in people who support, say, a gold standard and uh, that sort of approach to monetary policy and Bitcoin um, supporters, or as opposed to fiat currency, which is government backed, um, is is based is um, you know not backed by gold. Uh, 
And, you know, there's a Federal Reserve and all those sorts of things. Like there's a reasons why there's all these political angles that you've heard in, rea- in relation to Bitcoin. And it comes down to this question. And so the real civil war here is between the one side that, that believes in that aspect of it. Is it, you know, is it against the Federal Reserve? Is it against this sort of thing? Wants it to be its own currency? And the other side that, wa- that sees the technology and what it could potentially enable. And there needs to be changes made to the protocol to make that possible. And there's just a fundamental division here. And so right. actually, I, I think the division, if anything, is probably more between Silicon Valley and kind of... Uh, Speculators. Bit, well, I would say Bitcoin true believers. Yeah. And I don't mean that pejoratively. I mean that where they see it, like the, init- the original Satoshi, um, uh, you know, document and writings were more in line with that sort of view. I mean, he was very skeptical of things like the Federal Reserve and he wanted to create an actual currency. Um, and and that it's a fundamental philosophical divide. And uh, and so I think this is, division is real and, and I'm not sure how it will be resolved. I'm not that deep enough in the community to know, but I'm deep enough to know that this, like when you get to a core question of what's the point, um, yes, they're, they're, like the future is in doubt. It's fascinating though to watch. Fortunately, I don't really have a dog. I think I have seven bitcoins somewhere, which means I, at one point, where they were worth more than seven thousand dollars, and they're now worth about two. But um, I don't. I mean, it's free money as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the the from my perspective, what I've written in the past is uh, the the to the extent that Bitcoin is not viewed as money, the more interesting and valuable it becomes systematically. Um, and again, do I you think mean the technology of blockchain or? Well, bo- both. I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I think that and this is such a, this is a, such a complex subject. I mean, certainly the blockchain idea is fascinating. There's a debate, you know, can you have Bitcoin independent of the blockchain? Um, you know, it, a lot of it gets down to this question of sort of um, one thing that, uh, again, I need a less pejorative term than like true believers or whatever, but like the true believers really hone in on is that, there's no trust required in Bitcoin. It's a trustless system. Um, and I think what people forget and, and it's easy to lose sight of is uh, all systems, all institutions that involve humans have some sort of structure to them. The question is whether it's explicit or implicit. And you're seeing that play out in Bitcoin right now. Like there is governance in Bitcoin. There are people who are in control. And it turns out, as, as, as my current is finding out, that um, just because it seems like theoretically there's no one in control uh, doesn't mean that there isn't someone in control. What this and, reminds and that, me so much is the, the battles that happen in open source projects all the time. Well, it reminds me, of, the, the company reminds me of is, is Zappos, actually. Um, hmm. the, the shoe company that's doing yeah. their, like, holacracy. Oh, like, the holacracy. Sort of there's thing. nobody in charge. There's no hierarchy. Mm-hmm. Which is... Which do is your BS. best work. <laughs> yeah, there's always, like... There, you, you look at any sort of human institution there there are there are structures that will emerge and the question is do you want them to be planned like they are in most corporations or do you want them to be be implicit and it's easy to say oh implicit and natural is all sort of good until you realize that's how things like you look at tech and you see how uh, we have a diversity problem and why is it that we managed to start companies that end up being all male white and Asians well because we just we just hired our friends and we got recommendations. Well, if all I mean, unless you are explicit and planful, like that's what's going to happen. And again, there's there's good things too. You, oh, we have a consistent culture. We all believe the same sort of thing. Well, and you, we all pull on the same oar. Like, okay, but like, you, there will always be structure. And the question is, is it implicit? Is it explicit? And again, I think you're seeing that happen in Bitcoin. You see it happen everywhere. And on the other hand, there was a flower grown in space. Scott Kelly, with the first picture. Thank you, Twitter, for sharing this momentous occasion with all of us of a space flower grown in the International Space Station. It's a zinnia, by the way. It's I love that astronauts can tweet that. There's some of my favorite tweets are random things from the yeah. space station, like yeah. flowers and plants and YouTube and videos storms, too, right? Everything. Yeah, absolutely. It's great. <laughs> Was, didn't it, Chris it, Hadfield do a, a, a Bowie YouTube video that he, yeah. I guess, somehow uploaded? 
from the right, ISS. And then he, he did a full uh, full album after that too. The, it, it was actually encouraging to see that flower blooming because they posted a picture, I think, last week or two weeks ago, of some of their other flowers and plants that were uh, not looking very good. So yeah. that's actually pretty encouraging that uh, that it's not just in the Martian that you can grow things. In space. You know, it's funny that you say that because it's the first thing you think of is uh, is uh, Mark uh, Watley growing right. potatoes on Mars. <laughs> Sciencing the f out of this. Sciencing the f out of it. That's <laughs> awesome. We live in very and in very interesting times. If there's one thing that I get I, I get out of doing this show is not only what, being an observer to this, but getting really smart people like Tim and Steve and uh, Ben to talk about it. And uh, I, I just I'm very feel very fortunate. We're gonna take a little break. Come back with more. Go ahead, to Ben, if you want to drink some tea. Or some uh, fine uh, scotch. It, it, it's just like shows up occasionally. Like, <laughs> I, I know. It, it, it might literally be a frog. <laughs> it's literally a frog in his throat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> literally. I just, did I just title the show? Yeah. <laughs> I think you did. Congratulations, Ben. Uh, our show today brought to you by Carbonite Online. A backup S stuff happens. And while it's unlikely that you will be abandoned on Mars, it is true that your data could be disrupted. Uh, and if you're in business, losing your data means could mean losing your business. That's why a great backup plan is so important. You're planning for disaster. You wouldn't run a business without fire insurance. Get some data insurance from Carbonite.com. One of the things that makes Carbonite work is that you're not just backing up locally. You're backing up to the cloud. So if there is a massive disaster, if there's a fire or a flood, or somebody comes in and wipes your business out, just takes everything... You're not relying on those backups that Joey from the mailroom uh, stuck in the closet last week. You got stuff on the Carbonite Cloud. Automatic, continuous backup. No more downtime with Carbonite Cloud Backup. Protect the files that keep your business running or your home running smoothly. No wonder, no wonder more than a one and a half million homes and small businesses trust Carbonite to back up their computers and servers. Now, I know a lot of you are geeks and say, well, I could easily uh, do an R-Sync to an Amazon Web Service S3 uh, instance. And uh, and yes, you probably could. Would you rely on it? I think it's probably safer, better to trust Carbonite. And certainly there are a lot of people who aren't going to roll their own who really need good backup. Try it free. Carbonite.com. You don't need a credit card. And in fact, if you use the offer code TWIT, you'll get two free bonus months if you decide to buy They've really got this nailed. Carbonite.com, the best online, automatic, full-time cloud backup for you and your data at home or at off at work. Uh, Carbonite.com. Let's see here. Google I.O. has, uh, they, they dropped Sundar Pichai. I think this is really fun now that it's not Larry Page anymore. Sundar Pichai, the CEO of Google, has made the tweet announcement that I.O., is uh, coming May 18th to 20th. And interestingly enough, and we ha we were trying to figure out how they're going to do this, not at a Moscone Center or a normal convention center, but at the Shoreline Amphitheater, where uh, uh, Neil Young has his regular uh, yearly bridge benefits, where Carlos Santana plays. This is a concert venue, in fact, with a big lawn. I don't know how they're going to do a whole Google I.O. there. Yeah, the, I mean, that's the question. Are they, are they going to have? What are they going to have? It's all the side sessions that that is right. That's our question mark. I mean, yeah, sure, you can do a keynote there. Well, um, it is in Google's but, backyard, so we were thinking maybe they would send autonomous vehicles to get each and every visitor. <laughs> that'll be a lot of vehicles. <laughs> just those technical and bicycles there. that they have. That'll be. That'll be oh yeah, just put some bicycles out front, a couple of segways, and you just roll on over to the Google campus. Well, um, I mean, I, I, it is. It, it is. I, I'm actually super interested in this. I mean, I, I, I did nothing to write per se, but I mean, just kind of speculating. I mean, if they do really, if you if you step back far enough, it it wouldn't be a shock if Google scales. At least from my perspective, if Google scales back their sort of um, developer platform support sort of thing. I mean, for for them from a strategic perspective, uh, par particularly on Android. I mean, apps are a necessary thing that they need to be competitive but it's not it's not core you know, business a, right um but that said i mean it, it's it's it, like the, <laughs> it's pre it's pretty important so this is really interesting I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens with the rest of the program and schedule um yeah. and and you know what obviously what, what it means 
I think you could also make the case that those sessions could happen offsite or purely online, you know, as long as you had the developers, uh, or, or excuse me, the Google personnel talking about the new APIs and streaming that online. And yeah, why do you have to go to Google? Via, why via do you have, room, yeah. Kind of yeah. Uh, I, you know, I think there's obviously a lot of value in people getting together at Google I.O. and actually seeing physical demonstrations of things. But presumably, you know, I think by and large, a lot of that's just there for the media to be able to write about what cool new things Google's up to. And, and maybe that's what this is turning more into. They have a big splashy keynote like they've had in the past. The media gets to go there and write about all the cool new things Google's up to. And then developers go back to their computers and learn all the valuable things that they need to do to, to build the next generation of apps. Uh, you know, they, again, the question, do they physically need to be there to make that happen? I'd be I a lot easier for uh, Sergey Brin to parachute in. Oh, I remember that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he had to land on the roof at Moscone. Twice. That's great. <laughs> Actually, he he didn't do the parachuting, did he? He no, they had stunt guys. They had stunt men right. doing that. Yeah. He was just and there they... shooting it with his Google Glass. <laughs> with her Google Glass, by the way. Are we going to see more Google Glass stuff? They supposedly have a new design. Yeah, it seems like 2.0. We might even see it uh, in a couple months at I.O. Yeah. Does anybody uh, like want this? Close. I think it, they're going to go. It's not going to try to kill your smartphone like they did at, you know, that first round. Or not necessarily kill your smartphone, but, you know, become a consumer type gadget. I think it's going to be, you know, an, an enterprise gadget, industrial gadget, kind of like, you know, the HoloLens is working on right now. I, I don't think it's going to be normal. People are going to go to the store and buy this thing. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have a place in the world of VR and AR because it's not really either of those. It's actually just a display over your eyebrow with a camera. Mm. Well, I, I think it gets to the, the, the that, that timing issue I talked about before. I mean, um, first off, I... I push back against the way people kind of instinctually lump VR and AR together. Uh, again, maybe there's, t there's certainly technological connections, but I think, you know, a computer and a phone are the same thing as a console and a, and, or a better example, a console and a, and a phone are basically the same thing as well. If you want to get technical about it. Well, but, but uh, I do have to point out, Ben, I know what you're, I know where you're going with this and I'll let you go on, but I do have to point out there have been now some hybrid approaches where you're in your Oculus Rift but you don't run into a table because in, it's in your real space and it shows up in your VR as a real obstacle. Sure, and that gets to the point that they are they are technically similar, or technically, in, I mean, you're, 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 there's some sort of thing image in your eyes. Eyes are involved in right. Um, but the the big difference is how you use them, uh, and and something like a, v, a VR thing, like an Oculus, you it's it's a what I term a destination device. Like you make a decision, like I am going to use the, the rift now and you go and you put it on and then you use the rift and then you finish and you take it off and then you move on. And it, it, there's a, there's a big vein in technology of this. That's where consoles fit, right? You go and you sit down and you play a console it's essentially game. a gaming device. You're saying, well, I mean, or well, no, not just gaming. There's also movies, right? You okay. sit down and you watch a movie okay. and then you stop watching the movie. And, uh, and that's a very large and profitable space to be. Um, but the, there's another space of technology, which I would call accompanying technologies, things that are with you as you go about your day. And this is the reason why the smartphone is so dominant and such an important platform is not because uh, we, we make an appointment to go use our smartphone. And the reason why Facebook is such a big deal is not because we say, oh, I'm going to go use Facebook now. It's four o'clock. It's because they're, they're omnipresent. They're always with us and they're there when we need them. We can pull it up and oh, I have three minutes in line and look at Facebook and play Candy Crush or whatever. That's what makes Candy Crush a very different sort of game than Call of Duty, right? One, you sit down to play Call of Duty. You don't like sit down. Oh, I'm going to block off a few hours tonight to play Candy Crush. You might end up spending a few hours, but the way you, the way in which you go about doing it, your posture as you do it is, is, is very different. I think and you might be making the same mistake, though, that somebody who was... Uh, <laughs> In the, in the world of computing where it was a desktop computer and you said, you know, someday you'll have that in your pocket, they might say, oh, that's crazy talk. Nobody wants to do that. A desktop computer is a destination no, what, what device. I'm saying is I, no, what I'm saying is I think AR... You're looking at current technology, maybe not what might be happening. No, I, I, no you're, 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 you're mishearing me. I'm actually... I, I, what I'm saying is AR is very different than VR. Well, I'll agree with you on that. AR is more interesting in the long run to me because AR is an accompanying technology. Like, so I actually think Google Glass is very interesting. I think the timing was wrong and, and probably the tech wasn't ready and the way they approached them might not have been right. But the idea of having 
uh, an, aug- an augmented vision and and a computer with you as you go through your day to day activities. That by definition, right. the market is much bigger from an attention perspective, from a time perspective, right. because it's all the time in your day. And so my distinction is between AR and VR, which VR will be fine and interesting. Um, I think I, I just I think that AR in the long run will be bigger than VR simply because it's it's yeah it's like uh, that a makes sense. But will VR continue where you're isolated from your environment? Will that kind well, of I mean, VR continue? You could have like the the what's what's the uh, up you know, or yeah no um, Wally sort of sort of scenario right. where people just live in VR. I wouldn't mind. Um, I'll do that. I, I I mean, bring me a I, coke and a batch of fries, and I'll just sit in my little floating car and. I mean, it's, it's, very, Life is good. it's, it, it's possible. I mean, <laughs> there, you know, reality to us is what we perceive at any moment in right. time. So it can be like to you, uh, you could say that, oh, people want to actually live real life with with people like, well, they w- at the end of the day, it's just neurons firing. I mean, if whatever triggers that triggers that that's a um, really interesting point. I mean, uh, VR, as it stands now, you're Im- immersed in a kind of semi realistic environment but it ultimately it could be your reality yeah, then there's what is it? couldn't have both if, if you imagine you know there's a lot of sorts of talk about contact lenses that can project images on the you, you can imagine a situation where you could have an augmented reality experience and then ultimately right. if you want to go full vr that your vision could be completely occluded by some sort of a virtual representation of you know your current landscape or a fictional landscape so you know i, I would like to think that down the road these two things will kind of blend together and you'll simply be stepping from one to the other somewhat seamlessly um but, but yeah ultimately in the short term at least in in the midterm ar is definitely the sort of thing that you you can apply to your current day to day life, whereas VR is going to be much more of a gaming entertainment sort of thing. As much as Facebook wants to turn into a social experience down the road, and maybe they'll figure out a way to make, you know, Second Life cool for a new generation. But each with but, their uh, own uh, merits and value and usefulness. For sure, yeah. and I'm excited but what about t- the, what the Tim said is, What Tim said is really interesting too, because uh, based on what we've heard so far, what limited things we've heard so far about Magic Leap, that's exactly what they're going for. That's, their, the, that's, their Google's, that's Google's uh, Right, and company. that's Google too, right. and yeah. or they have a heavy investment in them rather. Right. But what they're doing is, you know, their technology kind of, this is not the terminology they'd probably want us to use, but they kind of blast the images right into your eyeball and they can dial it up, you know, from AR, they dial it straight up to VR and back again um, as needed. And you know, that's the kind of one gadget to rule them all. The ultimate goal is to not only, you know, have something cool uh, entertainment experience, but also just eliminate most of the screens in your life too. That's really what they're going for. And that's like a really bold mission for that company. But I mean, yeah, we're, we're yeah, right this now. is Magic Leap's really kind of misleading no, that's, video. That's augmented <laughs> reality. And, yeah. you know, people, I mean, these are kids in a gym right. and they're implying that what the kids are seeing, by the way, the kids are not wearing anything is a giant whale leaping out of the gym floor. That's not, though, what the kids saw, obviously. It's a shame the kids right. can't see it because some of them are going to get crushed by that whale. <laughs> that Boy, it'd be nice yeah. if they could see it. Yeah. Do you think, really though, I mean, we'll have anything like that at some point? Microsoft I mean, actually we, really thinks they're onto something very similar to that and wow. where the resolution is so How good. would you do that? With contact lenses? What would you... It, it's some kind of thing where, again, they haven't shown any of what right. they have, but these people, um, John Dewar spoke at our conference, I think it was two years ago, our BI Ignition conference, and he was just like, this thing just blew my, knocked my socks off. It's amazing. How does and this I mean, compare to HoloLens, Microsoft's v, uh, AR solution? I, it, it's totally different. So HoloLens, I was actually a little disappointed with how narrow the right. f- field of view is. Um, you know, if you look in your peripheral vision, the images that you're looking at kind of disappear. It's cool. You can walk around the room and like walk around these uh, fake objects in real life, but it's nothing like those HoloLens videos show. We know a little more. Uh, a HoloLens uh, uh, evangelist, Bruce Harris, spoke at an event in uh, Israel, uh, and Brad Sams is reporting uh, that he shared some more information about this. A five and a half hour use battery life, unless you're on heavy load, and then it'll be two and a half hours. Um, anything can connect to the device as long as it supports Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And here he addresses that tricky field of view I- image, with, you know, whether you're looking through a slot, a mail slot or what. He said it's basically like a 15-inch monitor about two feet away from your face. And the reason, finally giving a reason for this and confirming it, 
is because of cost and battery life. But Harris said as manufacturing improves, the company intends to expand the field of view. It's just a price issue. Uh, he says it's being made by Microsoft, not by a third party, but not in the U.S. Uh, and, of course, we know that Microsoft has announced there'll be a developer edition for $3,000 uh, coming out at some point uh, this year. So, you know, we're in early days of all of this stuff. I mean, uh, it's interesting. VR must be easier to do. I think it is technically, technically a lot easier to do. You don't have to calculate in real time, real world surfaces and respond to them. Um, but that, so that's a little bit ahead right now, but the, I, I think both will be very important and I'm kind well, of with you, you Ben, I'm, I will, I would probably wear an AR device of some kind, whether it's glass or HoloLens or something else, uh, a lot. I mean, I would love the idea of being in the real world, but getting augmented information about that real world. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, the, the, a dedicated device uh, is going to be uh, ahead. And, and what I mean dedicated, not just dedicated in that that's all the device does, but the device is dedicated to doing one sort of job. And like the, like the, 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 the gaming or console world and movie world has traditionally been ahead, and then things come along, you know, things like, your your phone come along come along behind, um, but that but eventually they become good enough and um, and this is I think the the one I, I've been actually relatively skeptical and critical of 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 Facebook thinking that Oculus will be be a platform of the future. I think they certainly they want and expect it to be more than just the next console. Um, and one reason to uh, and so I think that's why like Google and Microsoft have been more focused on the AR sort of things, which is, I think, is more about the platform of the future. And because Google doesn't own Magic Leap. They've just invested in it via Google Ventures. Um, but, you know, if you want to have a defense of, of Facebook going the, the sort of Oculus route, it's that, well, it is going to be the market first. I mean, you can buy one now or pre-order one now. And and because, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an easier problem to solve. And then can you branch out from that to more of an AR view? Maybe. Um, we'll see, we'll see how it'll be it'll certainly interesting to see how it plays out. Um, there's a go to market challenge with any dedicated device, um, which Microsoft warned with, you know, they wanted the Xbox to be the computer for the home. The problem is like by starting with gaming, yes, there was an established market, but they ended up making it too expensive to be a computer for everyone. Um, you know, the, I think, uh, there will be, there's always, a, that's always the challenge with building a platform from a dedicated device is you end up, having a real tension between your hardcore customers and just casual people. Um, for example, I, I didn't order an Oculus. I'm going to get a... I've unfortunately ordered two. Orpheus. You want to you want to borrow one of mine? Sure, I would love to. You um, know, you I, have I, to I, buy a new computer, too. Yeah, well, I, I would buy a new computer. Um, it was more, I, more I, I, I kind of forgot about it, and then there was like already delayed till June. I'm like, well, we'll yeah. see. I, I'll yeah, also get the more because I already have a PS4. Yeah. So. I'm in June as That's well. I had this little thing called CES going on, so I was a little late in ordering. And I jumped June, on so. it, and I got May. But nice. then I found out, because I'm a ki I was a Kickstarter backer, that I'm going to get a, another one, a free one. Um, I don't hope those come sooner. We should get those first, right? I think you will. Yeah. But it's not just going to be Oculus. You got a lot of people are very excited about HTC's Vive, which uh, is in a relationship with Steam. Those are two good players. Sony's got their own helmet, and now Google has really doubled down on AR or VR. They have uh, taken uh, 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 Clay Baver, who was VP for Product Management. He was in charge of Gmail, Google Drive, Google Docs. He also was in charge of Cardboard. He's now dropping all the apps, and he is going to be uh, a senior vice president in charge of VR. They've got a guy doing VR full-time at Google, and a fairly, I think, fairly high-level uh, guy. So that seems like uh, his, his title is VP Virtual Reality, or VP VR. Which to be is, fair, this is what companies like Google do. Right. Uh, they, 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 they set up a thing and have a big press release announcement, and everyone... Um, you know, because they're the big dog, like, oh, they're going to take over and do this. And then, um, you know, that was my, that was the story of Microsoft in the nineties and two thousands. Right. And now it's Google today and we'll, right. we'll, we'll see. Well, everybody wants to be in this space. That just tells you this is an important space, right? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think in the long run, I mean, I, I, I'm 
still more optimistic about about things like the watch than I think most people. But in the long run, if you think about what would replace uh, a, a smartphone, um, you know, I think it, it's this is an obvious sort of area to, to end up in. You think of a smart watch is the is the next thing. I think I, I think there it, it will offload more and more right. functionality from a phone from a phone. But obviously, there's there's an input um, challenge. I, I did an interesting so. thing right before the show. We had a sixth grader who wanted to interview me, and I and he was starting to write take notes on his smartphone. And I thought, oh, this will take a while. <laughs> so I said, well, wait a minute, I have. A app I just put on my iPhone that attaches to the watch that has a complication on the watch that allows me to record, and I press the record button. Uh, it's uh, what is it called? Press record. Chat is that? Uh, press record now. I can't remember. Let me look it up here. Uh, but it, it was it just press record. It was it was awesome. The audio I could play you the audio. The audio uh, of from my watch. I'm sitting here with Addy. Sounds pretty good. I am sitting here with Addy, who is going to now ask me some questions for Addy's. Doesn't that sound I pretty search, much yeah. like I, I search paper in sixth grade? Question one. This is uh, me, what kind of and I'm not. Businesses are most affected by ad blocking. I'm not even really talking into my watch that much. I mean, it's kind of there. You do need this because Steve, you could use this for interviews and stuff. I'm I mean, totally gonna. I'm downloading it right now. This it's amazing, awesome. and and, yeah. and uh, you need not all the watch <laughs> faces support the complication. I'm using, um, uh, what, what is the name of this chronograph? But the complication on chronograph, you have a little microphone complication. You tap that, it records, and then the, the cool thing is it immediately transfers it over to the phone. So as I was able to email this back to Addy, uh, as soon as we were done. What's the app called? <laughs> Just press record. Where did I find out? I think I found out about this on Mac Break Weekly. One of our uh, hosts, probably Renee Ritchie, or might have been. Yeah, I think it was Renee told me about this. Isn't that cool? That's so that neat. is, this is the first app on the watch <laughs> that I really thought, okay, that takes advantage of the watch's form factor in a unique way. I mean, I've got a stopwatch application on here, big deal. You know, I mean, I could do that with a Timex. Oh, the big thing for me is notifications. I mean, I, I just mm. love not having to pull my phone out of my pocket. That said, uh, it, I will note that um, I, I like the watch. I still wear it every day. Um, it, it, it has reduced its utility in for two reasons. Uh, one, cold weather, because I have oh. long sleeves on now. Oh. And so uh, there's more effort involved in looking at it, um, which has been complicated by, no, no pun intended, has been uh, complicated by the fact that I, I broke my arm, which made it much. I didn't have another. Oh dear! I didn't have another hand to pull my sleeve up. So it actually, for for a few weeks anyway, it ended up being that pulling the phone in my pocket was more convenient than looking you're, at you're my watch. You're not in a cast. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, I, I just got oh, the cast off. Actually, oh, this was the fall you told us about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better. Uh, well, see, yeah. for instance, now I know that Ben Carson is doing a live Facebook feed of his uh, town hall in South Carolina right now. And I wouldn't have known that if the watch hadn't told me. Yeah, but this is why, I mean, really <laughs> what am I going to do with watch it? Involves, well, that involves you have to have control of your notifications, right. um, which uh, I think Apple has not done a good enough job making it easy to manage. Right. Um, because, you know, fortunately, I, I've trimmed down my notifications but even before I had the watch. But to uh, get back to Google, Google Glass, would that have, that might be really a reasonable use for Google Glass. I mean, it could have done all those things we just talked about. Well, there's the social aspect, right? I mean, you got to, you know, have this thing on your face. And I think that's, that's the, part the dork, that, dork part. Yeah. Well, that could, that could, it gets, even you know, gets back to the Uber <laughs> stuff and all that sort of thing. Like to, to techno, technological change doesn't just depend on getting the technology right. Like, especially the more that technology enters into the real world, in the case of cars, in the case of TV, or in the case of wearing something on your body, like, there has to be real societal change in mores and in what's what's acceptable and what's not. And wearing something on your face is certainly is certainly a part of that. I mean, but yeah, absolutely. There, there, you can see the idea of being able to just flick your eyes up and and, and see something going on would be great. I mean, the, the one interesting about the watch, and I think uh, Neil Patel nailed this right at the beginning in, in his Monster Review, but it's certainly been the case, is people uh, are much more, feel much more, not offended, but they feel much more awkward about you looking at your watch to see notification than even they do. You can be in a, like, 
we, we've had it's smartphones an insult. for so long. It's an insult. What, but what's weird is you can it's like I'm you bored. I could be at coffee and right. I could be looking at my phone and you would just keep talking because right. we've had smartphones long enough that you right. know I'm not ignoring you. I'm just checking something. Whereas the watch hasn't been out long. Like you, you would be more offended by, by a point three second glance at my watch than you would at right. me actually pulling out this thing and putting it in front of my face. And it, it's so bizarre. People will, people will keep talking even as you pull the phone out, but they'll stop talking when you look at your wrist. Just because there's a social part of it. Yeah, it's that old metaphor of we used to use watches to tell time and it also says boredom. You know, I think, what was that famous debate? Was it George H.W. Bush who during the debate he was caught looking at his watch or something? So we, <laughs> right. so we have that old metaphor of this means I'm bored, you're bored. I, I need to get out of here and not, oh, I just got a text message from, you know, my best friend or something. And of course, we saw Jeb Bush looking at his watch doing something rather. Oh, I got to show you that video. Week, which was. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that cracked Segway's me actually. up. I saw. Thank you for reminding me uh, about that. Jeb Bush was uh, talking to the Des Moines Register because, of course, the Iowa caucus is coming up. And uh, he must have just recently received an Apple Watch because he apparently is a little confused about how it, uh, how it works. Had one for since the summer, at least, because I remember all his early campaign videos he was wearing. It. Yeah. Really? So, hmm. <laughs> uh, in that case, there's less of an excuse uh, for this uh, behavior. Let's go to the uh, YouTube uh, video. <laughs> so it's hard to say here, but let me play it again. You can hear somebody say, hello, and Bush looks around going, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> no, it's bad. And the editorial board laughs. My watch can't be talking. Yeah, yeah, it could. <laughs> that look of is uh, amazement is yeah, great. Like I'll call you back. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. I've never had my bat phone uh, to be turned on. <laughs> That's the coolest thing in the world. I think that besides being an awesome ad for Apple, I think it kind of humanized him a little bit. I like that. I absolutely agree. I think that's the most human side of Jeb Bush I've seen yeah. throughout this whole campaign process. I mean, you could you could say as some as Crewell just said, Kevin Crewell in the chat room, Jeb is dumb as a brick. You could come come up with that conclusion, especially <laughs> if you know he's owned this watch for months, or it's just cute. He didn't really he didn't really know. I don't know. I don't know where I go fall down on that one. <laughs> Je, to me, Jeb Bush looks like the potential savior from a Donald Trump candidacy, so I'm kind of rooting for him a little bit. Uh, let's take a break. We, uh, we're going to come back. I'm sorry I put politics in here. I Take it out. Take it out. Take Edit that out, right? <laughs> right. They're going to edit that out. Done. Done. Ah, whatever. Techinsider.io. That's the new publication for Business Insider, and Steve Kovac is uh, one of it. What is your title? Your managing editor? Deputy editor. Deputy. Deputy editor. Do you get a I star, so. a badge of any kind? Well, I've asked, and they still won't give me one. <laughs> I, keep bugging, I keep bugging Henry, and he still hasn't given me a deputy badge yet. So. <laughs> I love that. Uh, it's great to have you, Steve. Always a pleasure. Joining us from New York, from Brooklyn probably, yeah? Uh, no, uh, Manhattan. Oh. I'm a, yeah, I moved on from Brooklyn. Oh, then. you have New yeah. York values, eh? Yeah, I do have New York values, yeah. Was that a story in New York? I saw some of the Daily News Oh, my covers God, you have no idea. Oh, that's <laughs> all anyone could talk about for 24 hours. Oh, you mean like the fire department, the FDNY? Oh, you mean that kind of values? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what I was talking about. Uh, we also have from Taiwan, where they now have a, uh, for their first time ever, they will have a female prime minister. You want to wade into complicated politics. Oh, uh, well, <laughs> I do. When we come back, we could talk a little bit. Because she used social media quite effectively, I mean, I hear. Or well, is it? I, I, I would say it's used. I mean, the, the, the real social media, I, th I think, story is actually in the U.S., what's happening there. Yeah. Um, well, that, take a, no, we're going to take a break. And you can answer that. You can, but uh, we will talk about uh, Tsai Ing-wen, the uh, president, not prime minister. You have Tsai a president. Ing -wen. Say, say it again. Sai Ingwen. Sai Ingwen. 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 There you go. That's, that's better. Tones are so wrong. But pronunciation. Ingwen. Is it a one? Uh, it's actually it's actually uh, the same characters as English. So her name literally means uh, English. Huh. Interesting. As in the language. Yeah. Ingwen. Tai Ingwen. Tsai Ingwen. Don't, 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 don't say the G. Ingwen. Ingwen. 
No, no g. All right. Thank you for no, the lessons. Ink. How's your Chinese? Is it good? Uh, the way I answer is, uh, it depends on how uh, on who's talking, uh, who's asking me. <laughs> yeah. You, you it's better than mine. Not a, as good as would, Mark Zuckerberg's, probably. Uh, no, it's much better than Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> His Chinese isn't that good. Is it? Uh, is it bad? Well, he he has he has he has an excellent vocabulary, and his his actually his listening comprehension is very good. In some respects, is actually is probably better than mine. Uh, but his pronunciation is is pretty terrible. He doesn't really use tones at all. Uh, um, that's in critical Chinese. in Chinese because ma well, and ma are very different words. Right. You, I mean, yeah, you can dramatically change the meaning. I mean, he because he is. What what it sounds like is it sounds like he's someone who is very busy and devoted a set of part of his day to like hardcore studying, and which we, would make sense of being Mark Zuckerberg and not enough time with an actual Chinese speaker who right. is correcting his pronunciation right. and and having a good foundation there. That said, I mean, he, still clear, impressive he, as hell. We're not, not no, we're not super impressive denigrating no, he, the achievement. I think his vocabulary is probably better than mine. Um, and uh, and that's why he is understood and he's able to get right. across because he actually speaks. He has all the right words, the words in the right places. Yeah. Right, exactly. And so, but he sounds uh, like a robot, probably. Well, it just it just sounds weird. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I mean, I my tones aren't great, so I'm not I'm I'm the pot calling the kettle black. Yeah. And given the fact that I actually live in a Chinese speaking company and presumably have more freedom than Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, you I'm should be better than you are, is what you're saying. Right, exactly. Yeah. I, I, this is this is this is pure spite and jealousy. <laughs> speaking, uh, it's no, great. It's super impressive. I I I said I said that at the time. For the are rest. you in Taipei? Where are you? For uh, yeah, I'm in Taipei. Taipei. And uh, joining us from Upper New York State, how's the ice racing, Tim Stevens? Uh, a little too damp, unfortunately. Oh, it's been a man. warm winter. Uh, people were water skiing on Christmas what? Day. So it's uh, wow. no ice racing yet, unfortunately. That's right. Christmas Eve, it was like 72 degrees in uh, downstate. It was like yeah, summer. Yeah, 70 degrees up here on Christmas Eve, which is uh, not good for the ice production, I'm sorry to say. And a truck actually just crashed through one of the local lakes. Uh, oh, dear. Somebody got a little too eager trying to get out there on the lake. Oh, dear. So not quite yet. Dear, dear, dear. I can't help, I can't resist noting, for those of you watching video, Tim's highly impressive collection of badges, conference badges over your left shoulder there. I have a yes. collection, but boy, that thing is, that thing looks <laughs> like it weighs 50 pounds. Uh, yeah, and uh, every now and again, I walk by and knock it off the wall, and then I spend an hour and a half putting it back up there again. They are they used to be in, in nice order, but not anymore. And I've got a, a bunch more since uh, CES in Detroit. I got to still hang up on yeah. there too. So see, I'm trying Thank to you. cut down that. on my conference attendance, so my badge ball is not growing as big as yours. <laughs> <laughs> can't believe i just said badge ball hey coming yeah, was, up in just was, <laughs> just a little bit <laughs> or are we gonna edit out the awkward pause there? <laughs> <laughs> uh we have a newsletter now when did that start right now. just now this is the first week all right if you want to sign up for our twit newsletter we'll put it out every sunday for Monday consumption, it'll tell you what's ahead in the week for Twit. Uh, you can sign up at twit.tv slash newsletter. I have, this is uh, exciting, very exciting. And I will probably uh, be required to contribute some to it and others, but it's mostly just an update on what's going on, uh, network highlights, information about upcoming shows, reviews, picks, that kind of thing. Uh, we promise not to sell your email or in any way share it with anybody except us. And, uh, but you will get a weekly email from us, and that's it. Just one weekly email uh, telling you what's going on with Twitter. And it's free. Newsletters, as Reverend Dan says, are hot. Did you miss anything this week? We had a great week. You know what? I think we've created a video montage. When the editors aren't cutting, busy cutting stuff out of the show, they're doing things like this. Watch. Previously on Twit. I'm wearing this king's hat because for a brief moment this weekend, I owned Twit TV. What? This is an app called Stolen. I, oh, wait, wait a minute. I already own Leo Laporte. Oh, man. Triangulation. We are talking about the best photography in the world with one of the best photographers in the world, Vincent LaForet. Photography is ultimately about anticipation, knowing people, knowing their habits, and predicting what's going to happen several seconds in advance. Those are the, what the best photographers do on a regular basis. They're, they're incredible observers. 
know-how. No, I have a problem. My parents keep running into the garage door wall. I have seen people who put uh, a tennis ball atta attached to a yes. string in a garage, but this sounds like you want to do it with the Arduino. So this is my dad entering the garage with his TIE fighter. Stay on target. Turned off your computer. Stay on target. Oh, dad, no, stop. Too close. Ah! Too close. Tech News Today. It is not easy for bosses to monitor how long their employees are sitting at their desk. One thing that not many bosses have tried is secretly installing motion detectors. Yes, this is the Daily Telegraph. The staff there what? came back from the weekend break to find little gray motion and heat sensors. It didn't go down well, put it that way. <laughs> it quit. Jeez. It's free when you watch from work. And uh, yes, for those of you watching closely, our app pick of the week on iOS today was secret which promptly was shut down. Stolen. Huh? Stolen. Stolen, not secret. Stol secret is shut down too. Secret also shut down. Stolen. Uh, well, actually, we, should, we could talk a little bit about what happened with the stolen and why it was shut down. Uh, coming up, we got a great triangulation for you tomorrow. It's a book I've been recommending uh, in our Audible ads for some time called The Righteous Mind. Its author, Jonathan Haidt, is a professor of moral philosophy. Where do our ethics come from? Are they inborn or are they taught to us? You might, the answer will surprise you. Um, and it's very surprising. He also talks a little bit about why politics are so polarized in this country, why it's so difficult for uh, like minds to come to an agreement on anything. It's a fascinating, fascinating book. And I can't wait to uh, talk to Professor Jonathan Haidt. That's tomorrow on triangulation our show today brought to you by squarespace the place to make your next website squarespace.com whether you need a simple landing page their cover page thing is so cool i use cover page uh for my leoville.com front page it's a way to uh, in, in, introduce yourself and who you are to people to show them links to your other social media because one of the things that's great about squarespace is how it integrates in your Twitter, your Facebook, your Instagram, your YouTube, and on your LinkedIn, and on and on and on. Uh, it's I just I uh, I just love it, and it's so easy to modify. And Squarespace makes it really trivially easy to create a site, a blog, a portfolio. If you're a band, a site that includes tour dates and an easy to use calendar, you could sell. In fact, every template includes commerce, so you could sell your CDs. Or do donations. It'd be great for a charity. Uh, it's all built in, including mobile responsive templates that make it very easy for you to make a site that looks beautiful on any size screen. I am just such a huge fan of Squarespace. For affordable, easy to use, and state-of-the-art web hosting that never, ever, ever goes down. I mean, I don't, I don't know if they never go down but i've never had them go down in fact even if you get a lot of traffic it just they just it's so robust you'll get a free custom domain name with an annual purchase it's a great way to promote your business to create and manage your store and by the way your store and this is not your typical shopping cart experience it's not going to look like some dumb shopping cart it looks like your site it matches it it, it matches your ethos are you a musician do you have a a band do you have a business? Are you getting married? Don't go to one of those crazy marriage template sites. It's so much better on squarespace.com. Try it free right now. Just go to squarespace.com. Start your free trial. But do use the promo code TWIT, and you'll get 10% off when you decide to pay when you sign up. And you will. Squarespace. You should. Really. Squarespace.com. Use the offer code TWIT. We're talking tech. <laughs> With the big brains in the business, Tim Stevens from uh, CE, uh, CNET. His new uh, show, by the way, uh, Roadshow, is at theroadshow.com. It looks slick from the Detroit Auto Show, your first uh, your first shows. Really looks Thank great. Thank you very much. They're doing a nice job there. And I'm thrilled for you because I know you're, you're really into this subject. So it's nice to combine your passion you. with your job. It absolutely is. And yeah. I really appreciate the kind words. Yeah. I feel like that's what you've done too, Ben Thompson. It's clear you have a passion for the subject and you write so well at Stratechery. Uh, I immediately paid for a subscription because, frankly, the insight you offer is just second to none. Stratechery. And, and I always clarify, there's if you go to Stratechery, there are free articles. Oh, yeah. So what you pay for is uh, to get three extra ones a week, basically. So Really, really worth it. Really great stuff. And then the Exponent podcast. Is that going well for you? It is. It's going very well. Uh, Exponent.fm 
Um, so we're, we're, we're up to into the sixties now. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite popular. I think it's me and James Allworth who, uh, who's actually a co-author with, um, Clay Christensen of how we measure his life. And, uh, is a you know, great background. I love theory Clay Christensen. Society, so. That's great. I, I don't, I have not, I'm not familiar with James. So I'll have to start listening. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're, we approach things. Um, we do get into some of the analysis stuff and certainly th there's a, there's a, connection to Shashakari and what I write about. Um, but I think we're particularly interested in kind of the, the social impact and, um, uh, of things. I think like, I mean, this would be about cars, but I think you look at last week, we talked right. about inequality and yeah, you used the Paul like Graham that. essay as a starting point, which is a good place right. to start. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, it, it was certainly, uh, did a great job in sparking conversation. Yeah. Uh, the conversation, which is great. I think, uh, it was unfortunate in some of the, uh, the words were spoken, but they weren't conversational aspect, uh, which doesn't do anybody good. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, definitely check it out. Is it, if you're listening to a podcast, that's actually probably the, the product I should push, push more than, than the site. No, I, I'm not sure I agree. I think it's both. It's both. Some people like to read. Some people like to listen. I like to watch. Uh, and I can yeah, watch no, a lot. No video, no video <laughs> podcasts. I don't, no, what do we, I have to like make my bed and I have to like I know. Shower. What is this? What is this? I know. It's do, you have, do you actually have a stuffed animal or is that an yeah. actual cat? Oh, no, that, that's, no, that's my son's. He, he, oh, it's, okay. uh, it's, a, it's a Santa Olaf stuffed animal. Perfect. Um, yeah, I noticed that earlier. Because your and son what, isn't what? culturally confused enough. Yeah, I wanted to humanize myself. You know, I have, I have down, so. <laughs> also with us, my good uh, buddy, Stephen Kovac from uh, techinsider.io. He's at Tech Insider. Or no, you're not at Tech Insider. Well, yeah, technically. Are you? I guess, yeah. And at Steve Kovac. At Steve Kovac. Yeah, both. nice. You can see me both, but at Steve Kovac is the best way to follow me, yeah. I guess. What is the best pizza place in New York? You know what? I have not read that story yet. It so doesn't, I don't know. I could tell you right now, it ain't that pizza because it's square. You want yeah. to get into controversial is, topics. Jeez. That is yeah. not wow. pizza. Yeah, pizza's round, not square. It's not New York values. And it ain't sure. that pizza. Rizzo's fine pizza? No, I think not. I've never even heard of that yeah, place. No, nobody eats there. It's too crowded. Uh, anyway, great to have all three of you. And uh, let's just real quickly uh, congratulate. I can't pronounce her name, apparently. Uh, Sai, for uh, becoming the first uh, female president. So what's the story there? Is there a tech story, tech angle to that, Ben? Sai Ingwen. Uh, Sai Ingwen. No, I, I, I think um, She's the pro-independence pro party, though, right? Uh, well, I, I think that bo both parties are, at least in their public positions, um, m much more like oriented towards the status quo. Okay. Okay. Uh, you know, no, no one wants to, um, you know, there, there's always stories about, you know, instigating China or whatever. No one wants to instigate China. China right. does what China wants to do. Right. Uh, which is kind of forgetting in these stories. They're, 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 they have free will. It's like having a um, thousand pound gorilla over your shoulder, breathing that. Yeah. I mean, it certainly, it impacts the politics in all ways. I, yeah. I mean, I think that probably the more interesting tech angle in Taiwan generally was there was an, actually an excellent story in the New York Times on Friday uh, talking about the the struggles of Taiwan's, um, you know, tech industry and it's kind of the old guard is still really holding on, um, as far as like from just from an executive position and, and Taiwan really being, you know, was tied so closely to the PC in particular and has had a very difficult challenge in, um, kind of adapting to, to the new world order. And, you know, I think that, that that's in, in so much as there is an angle, it is the concern that, um, in general, tech won't be the driver that it has been for a long time. Um, and also that Taiwan needs to move beyond a sort of manufacturing sort of mindset and approach. And it's going to, it's a generational thing again. I mean, I think, um, the big thing that drove this election was, uh, discontent about things like wages relative to mm -hmm. real estate, for example. Um, and there's definitely a youth uh, much more of a, a component to this and a lot of disillusionment with the current, with the current government. I mean, um, I'm not going to wade in on the other side because, uh, you know, my job is about technology, not politics. Um, but, uh, 
it was it was definitely a sea change. The last two elections have been a real sea change. Um, just uh, the party in power basically almost wiped out. Uh, and so it'll be very interesting to see what happens over over the next couple of years. There is a tech angle because uh, Tsai is a cat lover. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> she is. Uh, which, so there you go. I mean, was, that's it. Uh, what more could you ask for? She, there also is a hashtag, Tsai yeah, there's a uh, actually. I mean, the, the, if you want to get like the tech angle, like here, here's a here's a picture that I took. Um, I, I took at the the Seven Eleven the other day, and the Seven Elevens here are amazing. Um, but here it's it's a it's a roller coaster. This is like a tabloid type magazine. It's hard to see, probably. Um, it's a roller coaster uh, with with Apple on the front, uh, and then all like a bunch of famous Taiwan component suppliers on the back, oh. and saying you know look out below sort of, <laughs> sort, of, sort of thing. Um, you know, concern about you know if if as as Apple and the right. iPhone goes, so goes a lot of Taiwanese companies. Right. Um, but in general, that's that's for better or worse, that's still the tech angle that matters is 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 component is components and, and the supply chain and, you know, the hopes for Taiwanese branded tech companies like Acer and Asus and HTC obviously uh, did not turn out. And um, there isn't a great software industry right. and that sort of hard to compete with a manufacturing, the manufacturing giant of, uh, of China. I mean, that really is tough. I mean, there, there are still successful, I mean, but very successful J companies Japan here. and Korea are both starting to see, feel this pressure, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think anything that 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 is, uh, you have to compete by being very highly, you know, differentiated. Right. And um, the the labor focused manufacturing. I mean, there's there's very different parts of the supply chain. I mean, everyone knows that phones are made in China, but actually, the value add of China is like sixth or something. Um, in an i, so if you look at an iPhone, because the final, it's it's actually it's assembled in China, China, but really the software is right. American, it, right? Well, if you go through and you and you and you calculate the value of the parts that go into an iPhone, actually the U United States is actually first. Uh, I believe South Korea hmm. or South, and South Korea, Japan, because, and Taiwan. Because Samsung makes the chips, right? Samsung right. and they in the memory um, right. also, and there's different parts. But then, like for example, like the camera, like the sensors made in Japan. Uh, the actual lens modules made in Taiwan. Uh, lots, oh, Taiwan, I think, by volume might have the highest number of suppliers of the iPhone, uh, or it, it's somewhere up there. And so um, the made in China, like there's lots of parts that go into making a phone. It's assembled in China would actually be a more appropriate right. term. Well, in and fact, that, Ty, the TSMC, the big Taiwanese uh, manufacturing company, uh, was second source now for the, uh, the chips, the uh, CPUs in, in iPhones, right? Well, they've been the sole source at times. It's kind of gone back and forth. Uh, I think it's right now it's split. Uh, I believe that people suspect that Samsung's going to get it back next year. Samsung just oh, got the Qualcomm 20 contract, which is a big deal. So, um, but yeah, the TSMC is is the largest uh, chip manufacturer in the world. Wow. Hey, if you have a Nest thermostat, you might have been left in the cold literally this week. That's what Nick Bilton said in his uh, New York Times article. Uh, the Nest thermostat, which is, of course, owned by uh, Google as the entire Nest company, is at a mysterious software bug. Apparently, there was a firmware update pushed a couple of weeks ago that drained its battery and sent Nick's home into a chill in the middle of the night. But Nick wasn't alone. Many, many Nest owners were. Now, Nick has a newborn. He says he was woken by the baby crying at 4 a.m. The Nest was off. His room was 64 degrees and dropping. Uh, apparently, uh, this was a quite a quite a bug, and not so much if you live in Los Angeles as Nick does, but very much so if you used a nest in your vacation home in the Rockies, for instance, and your pipes are frozen. Uh, there is a fix, but you have to un take your nest off the wall, plug it into a computer via USB, push a bunch of buttons. It's a nine-step process to reset it. Uh, it takes at least an hour, and meanwhile, you're freezing. <laughs> Oh, it's not a good thing. Nick says a number of his friends did the easy thing, which is go out to the hardware store and buy a $25 not-so-smart thermostat that actually worked. Uh, not kind of a black mark for Nick's Nest, but even maybe more importantly, a black mark for, for the Internet of Things. 
and smart home in general. Perfect. I mean, that's definitely yeah. one of those things that you you want to always work, especially if you're away on vacation and that kind of thing happened. You know, if you were away for two weeks and it was below freezing, absolutely your pipes would be burst and you could be in you could be in a lot of trouble. Yeah. Um, these are the things that absolutely have to work all the time. Um, just like the Nest Protect, um, that was another big black. Yeah, they, you waved at it to turn off the sound, but it turned out it also turned off the the, the smoke alarm. Yeah, <laughs> permanently. <Okay. laughs> Not such a good thing if you have a fire. Um, in fact, we were talking about this with Jason Calacanis again last uh, yesterday on the new screensavers. He's of the opinion that Nest is struggling a little bit. He thinks that there are some defections from Nest. People don't like working for Tony Fidel. And uh, that some of the Nest technology is not doing so well. Uh, maybe maybe this... And by separate... He made this point, which I thought was interesting. By separating Nest out from Google, making it a separate division under Alphabet... It, it, yes, there's more autonomy. Yes, the company can be run, you know, more independently. But it also means you can't hide failure. And it actually could, if an a company struggling like this, could uh, hasten its demise. Yeah, that, this is a pretty brutal failure, I think, by, by Nest. I'm actually, I think they've, it seems like they've skated by relatively unscathed. I mean, fortunately, all you, I thought there'd be a, a couple, you know, like, pipes bursting stories to Tim's point. I mean, that they're getting the tens of thousands of dollars potential right. worth worth of damage. Uh, but, I mean, the big challenge with, with selling something that's way more expensive than the standard is it's all about the delta between what you already have and what and what you're going to go out to get. And uh, Yeah, it's already Nest, four times more expensive or five times right, more expensive. Right, and so Nest has, uh, has offered all these upsides but if you have this big potential downside in buyers' right. minds, like now that, that that compresses the delta just as much as any feature can expand it. Uh, and um, Nick yeah, points out, by the way, that the, in deep buried within the uh, Nest uh, agreement is uh, a uh, requirement that you use arbitration. And so that if you did suffer some damage, uh, there are limits to the damages you can specify. And... Mm -hmm. You'd have to go to San Francisco for the arbitration. Uh, Advantages of well, software. Oh, wow. man. And you have to keep it confidential. Uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. We're seeing a lot more of that, right? Those arbitration clauses. Mm -hmm. and everyone reads them before they agree. Yeah, right. Oh, yeah, fine, whatever. <laughs> no, I, it, it's interesting. This is, this is an advantage of software for the companies right. is that you have to, like, there is a capacity to quick a EULA. I mean, like, if you... If you 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 can't quick a EULA in your Honeywell thermostat that you get for twenty five bucks at the at the software store, and so I think the the validity of EULA is, is I think a little still a little bit of an open question. Yes. Like, but generally it's been supported that you know because people are actively clicking. Except, um, whereas something like oh it was in the box and you implicitly accepted it is is you know much more difficult. Um, and hey. Nest took advantage. This is not the only Internet of Things uh, failure uh, in the news this week. One of our sponsors, Ring, that makes the Ring video doorbells, uh, had a problem as well. There was a post from a security a blogger uh, who had figured out that if you take the Ring video doorbell, which is a doorbell that has, is tied to your Wi-Fi as a camera, microphone, and speaker, uh, if you take it off, plug it into your computer, you can fairly easily... Uh, extract the user's uh, Wi-Fi login and password, okay. and uh, I I I tweeted, "Gee, I'd much be much more worried about losing my two hundred dollar doorbell than that." But the point is, you could put it then back on. You do this in the dead of night, put it back on, uh, hope that nobody noticed when they when you remove the ring, and then you'd have the password and you could continue on with it. Ring, however, had a better. Uh, ending to this story because it turns out that the Ring video doorbells are wi are updatable automatically. They are on the Wi-Fi and Ring was alerted of this security flaw, developed a solution and pushed it out to all active Ring devices uh, two weeks ago so that uh, at this point no Ring video doorbell is vulnerable. But it points out the we're gonna this is just the beginning of a lot of stories uh, because all of these internet things of devices, whether it's your Samsung refrigerator with a camera in it or your doorbell, or your, or your car. thermostat, or your car, they're all tied to your Wi-Fi, and if they security practices on these products aren't good, it could lower the total security of your network. I saw a great tweet today. I can't find it right now, but I think it was, it was something like, uh, 
In 19, 1995, our houses were full of digital devices blinking 12 o'clock. <laughs> in, in 2025, our houses will be full of digital devices with the password admin. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, one thing that Ring did right, which is it, they put in a mechanism for automatically updating the firmware instantly. And uh, that got them off the hook for this one. So they did do that right. And I think that that points the way for, for future. A lot of these devices are not updatable or don't have a mechanism to do that. Um, and that's a problem. That's going to be a problem. I wonder if the, the Nest can be updated over the year. In fact, was updated over the year. I think that was the problem is that they had pushed a firmware update, which then two weeks later caused this Nest problem. And once it's dead, you can't update it. <laughs> it's too late. Um, let's see. Um, Facebook mentions for Android, big deal. I did, though, have to do a live stream immediately just to see if it worked. Uh, Facebook Messenger, apparently an app for Mac on its way, according to photo evidence TechCrunch got from somebody. A, a U.S. widow is suing Twitter, saying that Twitter gave voice to ISIS. Her husband was killed in Jordan, and uh, she says, Tamara Fields... She says that when her husband Lloyd died in a November 9th attack on the police training center in Amman, Twitter knowingly let the militant Islamic group use its network to spread propaganda, raise money, and attract recruits. This is a tough case. No, uh, it's not. It's not a tough case. Why not? <laughs> because, uh, she, one... She wants triple damages. Twitter violated, she says, the Federal Anti-Terrorism Act. Hard to prove. Yeah, needless to say, I think it fails from... I, I'm not a legal scholar, but I would hope it fails from a legal standpoint, not right. in the obvious common sense standpoint. Right. That said, I mean, it's certainly you can make the case that Twitter's definitely significantly increased uh, regulation of what is allowed and isn't has opened them up to this more than they might have been in the past when basically anything was allowed. Um, but certainly... And they need to have knowledge or willful blindness for it to uh, uh, satisfy the, the legal standard. Uh, in this article, though, uh, from Reuters, uh, they do mention that uh, a couple of years ago, a lawyer convinced a Brooklyn, New York jury to hold Jordan's Arab bank liable for handling transactions for a Palestinian militant group, Hamas. Um, and uh, while that bank settled in August... Uh, it maybe pr provides a precedent. It's a tough one for Twitter, just in general. Um, I, it's, it's, I don't know it, what it, you do. I don't. Are, can you? Are you responsible for every bit of uh, stuff that's on Twitter? No, not not even close. It, it it again. It's the willful thing, and they've been shutting down accounts left and right from ISIS as soon as they get but alerted. You, but you every, can't yeah. permanently shut down uh, a person because. Right. They'll they just, just create, create a new, new account. account. It's yeah. too easy. Yeah. And then what are you going to do? Sue the entire internet or, you know, WordPress right. or you right. know, whatever. Yeah. That's, there's no case here. Well, I, I think it is a, um, it, it is a, a challenge for Twitter. Um, there was the controversy, um, controversy, uh, a couple weeks ago about the, the Gamergate guy getting his, his verified oh, yeah. check removed. At Nero. De-verified. Um, Deverified, yeah. yeah. Which is interesting because I think that actually that I mean whatever it had the, the complete opposite. That, impact, well, I'd rather right? I'd rather not wait. I, I'd really rather not not wait into it. But no, because I, we're I just publicizing general, the guy in his feed. Well, I think in general it's the exact opposite direction Twitter needs to be going. Yeah. Um. There are there are absolutely and I acknowledge strong arguments for allowing anonymity. On the flip side, there are very real problems with anonymity, and uh, I think that. Twitter should in generally be moving towards towards more verified accounts um, and and less and having less room for the sort of drive by sort of abuse that is that is unfortunately uh, much more suited to Twitter than almost any other network. I mean, the the beauty of Twitter is I can reach out to and have a conversation with anyone on the planet. They may or may not reply. Uh, one of the problems is that anyone on the planet can reach out and have a conversation with me, and sometimes that's not particularly pleasant. Now, for me, I don't really have a problem because I'm fortunate to 
uh, one, have great Twitter followers. Thanks, guys. I love you. And also to be a, I mean, to be frank, a white male who just doesn't don't have to deal with that. Um, there are others that aren't as fortunate. And uh, I mean, not as fortunate in their Twitter mentions. They're perfectly fortunate as human beings um, that have to deal with a, a, a significant level of abuse. And, and the problem for Twitter is at what point is that worth it? What point is it worth it to have drive-by call-outs that you didn't ask for? Um, and that's a, that's a, what's the word? It starts with an E. Uh, that's an existential problem for Twitter. Like people just not wanting to be there, not wanting to be on the platform. And I think, uh, there's the whole like free speech sort of thing. Like there's, there's different aspects of, of, of free speech in, in that one Twitter is not a government and the free speech is a guarantee that the government's not going to restrict your speech, not a corporation, but two, uh, allowing, allowing abuse and which by extension drives people away and makes people not want to be part of the conversation you are in aggregate limiting speech, arguably even more than just legislating against, against hate speech specifically, as hard as that is to regulate. And I think this aspect of of private corporation allowed speech, uh, it gets looked at that such a black and white issue that is free speech or it's not. Um, when free speech versus controlling abuse are not necessarily in opposition because there's a very real cost to speech that comes from unfettered abuse. Uh, and and it's more of an opportunity type cost, the sort of people and conversations that disappear. Uh, and no one, there's not an easy way to track or measure them. And I think that's a lot of people tend to undervalue that. Let's take a break. I want to do uh, some uh, final thoughts in just a second. But I do want to mention in this world of stress and strain, there is a place you can go for a healthier, less stressed life into your head with Headspace. Uh, I am I am a big fan of meditating. Have been using Headspace since July. Just a few minutes a day, and everything just gets a little bit better. I love every time I hear Andy Putty Putty Combs' cute British accent. I just <laughs> it kind of my heart rate slows, my blood pressure goes down. I've become a huge fan. Maybe you saw Andy's TED Talk, five and a half million views. He leads all the meditations in Headspace. Uh, he was a Buddhist monk for 10 years. This is really good stuff based on uh, thousands of years of tradition, but also many, many modern scientific studies that show the positive effects, like improving focus, relationship harmony, decreasing anxiety and stress. I love Headspace. I was so happy when I discovered it. And I want to invite you to try it for free. All you have to do is go to headspace.com slash Twit. They have the, a thing they call um, their Take 10 program. Because if you do this just for 10 days, and just I just invite you to try this 10 minutes a day for 10 days. It's not even 10 minutes initially. It's very, it's very brief. Uh, you will really see its benefits. And you can then decide if this is something for you. Do me this favor. I think it is awesome. Headspace.com slash twit. 10 free meditation sessions. I, I almost don't want to even use the word meditation. We need to come up with another word. The magic mindfulness session or something. It, but it really does the job. Headspace.com slash twit. You'll sleep better. You'll feel better. You'll be more relaxed. And because it's on your computer or your phone or your tablet, you really can use it anywhere, in the train, anywhere. Hey, here's some really good, by the way, thank you, Headspace, for your support of uh, This Week in Tech. Thank, thanks to all of our sponsors. Thanks to all of our Hosts today, too, our contributors. Really, you make a huge difference on the show. I'm going to end on a happy note. <laughs> After you tricked me into talking about both Taiwanese politics and Gamergate. <laughs> oh, Please, man, happen. you brought me down. <laughs> but the good news is the Puppy Bowl this year will be in VR, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, my Oculus doesn't come until June. <laughs> this is a terrible world. Can you wear cardboard for it? I hope so. Have with QBR. Cardboard. Yeah, it like will be fat. It'll be on YouTube, Animal Planet's website. You can see it in Samsung's Milk app. If you have the Gear VR, you'll be yes, able to okay. use the Milk app. Good. Uh, strap on your cardboard, folks, and uh, be able to. I actually am a big fan now of 3D video, and thanks to uh, the fact that YouTube and Facebook support it, uh, and you can just do this with your mouse, you know, and 
mouse around. It's fun on Facebook when they do those videos. I Did you see my videos from my vacation? I did 3D videos of my cruise ship. Cool. This actually is much higher quality. I was using the Theta, which is uh, the Rico Theta S, uh, which is um, inexpensive, 350 bucks, very easy to use. But this is really looks high quality. They're probably using something even better. Nikon announced a really interesting high quality 3D camera. Uh, at CES, I don't know if any of you guys got to see it, but I'm I'm kind of excited about this. I want to do Twit this way. Won't be yeah, as exciting it, as the Puppy Bowl. It definitely seems like the next generation of action cameras will be generating this 360 footage, which would be an interesting thing. You know, when uh, HDTVs came along and now 4K, there was a real glut of of content. And that's been one of the things that people are skeptical about VR because there's so such a small amount of content available. But if these you know 360 action cameras become popular. Maybe that'll be, you know, how a lot of people are consuming this content. Maybe that'll fill that gap until we have more, you know, cinematic quality content, that kind of thing. It's you know, I think, And I think the 360 stuff is more interesting than the 3D stuff. Oh, uh, much more, yeah. The, well, I, the one thing that people, are, like TV manufacturers, I think, you know, always pushing for 3D and pushing for 4K and that sort of thing, um, failed to appreciate is that a big reason why people bought HD TVs was not for HD. It's because the TV set itself was physically such a better object to have this thin thing is that this big massive box uh and i think that with with, with vr the the immersive aspect uh is is such a like that's just as important as the content itself like that it is a physically different sort of experience um and and as opposed to the 3d or or even 4k sort of i thing. love this this is a video from uh, my vacation uh, with a Theta S, I'm on the back of the boat. And what you can do is, yeah, it's like a vlog where you see me talking, but you can look around. You can look at what I'm looking at. You can look at what's going on. You can look at the sky. You can look at the ocean. You can look at what's going on uh, behind me. Uh, and this was a cheap $350 uh, camera. I, I, I take it with me everywhere now because I feel like this is a really interesting way. If you're, if you're, you know, I mean, if you're just talking on like we are, I don't know if there's much value to it. But if you're in somewhere interesting... The ability to look around is kind of neat. Right, especially once you can do that just by moving your head instead of having to... Well, you can if you had also. cardboard. I mean, obviously, you know, if, uh, but you have cardboard. Right, right. No, I mean, why? Or you're doing it on your phone. You can even, as you, you can move around with your phone and, and uh, with YouTube and Facebook, it senses your accelerometers and it actually does move around with you, which is kind of neat. I feel like this is... Uh, this is a surprise technology that came out of nowhere. Do you think this is why Hero's struggling a little bit? The GoPro uh, didn't GoPro uh, aren't aren't they going through some? They're in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah. They, what's yeah, what's that are. all about? The stock is tumbling. The, the laying off. It's all, I think, it's, it's, all it's all about the history of every single uh, uh, non-software differentiated hardware company ever. <laughs> yep. I mean they they sell they sell like. The story is that, or it's all about the, the community. The, the reality is, is there is no pure hardware company that doesn't have differentiated software that has been able to maintain sustainable profits. That's a market. really good insight. It's just too easy to copy them. The CS floor was littered with just dozens and dozens and dozens of yeah. GoPro clones, and they looked the same. And you know, these you know Shenzhen-based uh, companies just pump them out. Same, it's the same gadget. But it's always been that way, and GoPro has always been able to elevate above the herd by having this brand image, you know, yeah. these kind of silly-looking silver cameras stuck on the helmets of all the pro motocross racers and everything else that you want to be. Uh, but definitely, you know, as those things are becoming more and more commoditized, it's it's going to become more difficult for them. They've got to stay progressive. They've got to stay ahead of the curve. And right now, they don't have a, a an affordable 360 VR option. They do have that high-end Google thing that we saw on I.O. last year, but that's you know, $10,000 or something like that. They need a 360 camera and they need a drone in the market really soon. And certainly there's a lot of talk that those things are coming, but they're not here yet. Wouldn't you love well, to have... There's, there's two things. I mean, one, yeah, th those points are both well-made. But two, uh, a brand ultimately has to be based on something. Like, and 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 GoPro not being different is a right. problem for the brand in the long run. And then three, the reality is the brand that matters as far as community and content uh, when it comes to the sort of sports that GoPros focus on is Red Bull. I mean, Red Bull has has occupied the position that I think GoPro was striving for. And so they're a nice secondary brand, um, but that's a secondary brand based on an increasingly... Uh, 
disappearing brand value right. uh, and, and brands, that's why brands fade. The reason why the Apple brand, for example, Apple doesn't succeed because Apple absolutely does succeed because the Apple brand, but that brand in the long run, if Apple stopped innovating, if Apple stopped having interesting new features and new products, the value of that brand would fade as all as brands do. Uh, and how does Apple stay differentiated by having software differentiation? Like that's, that's how they differentiate their products is the key is iOS and that sort of thing. Um, and, GoPro by lacking that again, it, it, this is just what happens. Um, it, it, this is this is all uh, uh, unexpected. And again, the, the challenge as far as you know picking stocks off goes is, is timing. Although this is probably one that would have been easier to get right than others. I, I don't know what uh, Nikon's uh, 360 degree uh, action camera will cost or when it will be available. But uh, having had such a great experience with the Rico and knowing how much more could happen with higher quality images and better audio and so forth. I'm very excited about this category. This is kind of a out of nowhere category that does transform the action cam because, well, wouldn't you, Tim, when you're doing your ice racing in your truck, love to have a 360 degree view and uh, you could talk and people could watch you, but right. then they could also look out the window. Yeah. I'm also excited about uh, track this stuff on my motorcycle in the summertime. Mm -hmm. I usually have a camera mounted on, on the tail of the bike, but it's difficult to position cameras because you don't know if you want to see forward or backward. Uh, now you could just have one and see yeah. every direction. Yeah. You don't have to worry about it. In fact, it took me a while when I'm shooting these to remember, it doesn't matter. I don't have to point at myself. I don't have to point at anything. I just hold it, and it's getting it all. It I, took, I would start aiming the camera and realize, oh, what am I doing? I don't need to. I'm just confusing people by moving it around. Hey, hey Tim, does that, does that there, there was that video, and I think they, they, they're coming to market soon, that drone that, like, follows you. Yeah. Uh, does, that, does that really? actually work well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that actually? I yeah, mean, one I, of those just imploded. Is that the? Is that the company? I think it was Lily. Yeah. 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 Oh no. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Anthony. Intel Beck has one. Too. Intel has a really impressive one they showed at CES. It's like twelve hundred bucks, and it has that real sense camera that can dodge obstacles and all kinds of stuff. It was really impressive. Yeah, I, well, I mean, they have to make it to market, though, right? Yeah, That's yeah, the problem. Fun. Yeah. The crowdfunding one um, did, is not going to happen, I believe, which is a shame. Was that Nixie? Which one was that one? Nixie's that the Lily. one. Lily. Nixie. Lily. Lily. Yeah. Nixie's the one you wear. It's a wristwatch that's a drone, and you take it off, and it flies around. That was so weird, and it just didn't feel like that was going to go anywhere. <laughs> I don't know. God. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, I, I think that it. went on to HP or Intel's um, award award. Um, they're, they're not out of business anyway. I mean, they're still around. Yeah, there it is, Intel. Yeah. They had a demo at their uh, CES keynote. So it's not just a CG uh, animation? Apparently not. Well, you wouldn't want to wear that uh, that prototype, but... I mentioned before that, that, that the mistake technologists make is, is thinking too much about the technology and not enough about the go-to-market right. angle. Um, well, the only thing, the only thing easier than thinking about technology relative to going to market is thinking about, uh, is building concepts versus actual building, right. or, you know, right. There's, 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 there's a drawing board, uh, easy. There's concepts, uh, harder, but, but still easier. There's prototypes. There's actual producing something at scale, which is, um, there, there's a, the, the, a huge leap. And then there's actually finding Marketing. a market, yeah. which is actually even and bigger. Distribution, and, yeah, right. And the the focus, what people think about, and the focus of the press in, in general and stuff, uh, tends to be completely backwards relative right. to what matters uh, in those. All those you have to do is things. look at my sad graveyard of supported Kickstarter projects <laughs> <laughs> to realize. Mine too. I, <laughs> it's very hard to get these things to market. But that Oculus uh, is, you know, that's going to pay off pretty soon. Yeah, so I can't believe I get a free one. It's, it's, a a yeah, it's a portfolio. Yeah, it's a portfolio. <laughs> there you go. I am supposed to get my Robin smartphone soon. I don't know if I'll ever get the, uh, the. Uh, I bought I bought a um, modular smartphone case, which I still haven't gotten. But the problem is, by the time I get it, the smartphone it's designed for is no. I'm not going to be using that. So, crikey, you just can't win. Nine dollar computer might get that <laughs> smartphone. Supposedly, I get that next month. I hope I get a mechanical pencil someday. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Tim Stevens. Good luck. I hope the uh, lake freezes soon. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Yeah, I hope so too. It'll yeah. be hard to ice race without the ice. Yeah.
It's great to have you, and congratulations once again on the road show, the roadshow dot com. If you're into cars and what's happening with cars, you couldn't have picked a better time to do it or a better person to do it. Uh, Tim Stevens, congratulations. It's great. Thank you, Liam. Yep. Thanks also uh, to Steve Kovac. Techinsider.io is the new site. Not that new, six months old, but I feel like it's, that's new in, uh, in tech terms or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great stuff, including the best pizza in New York and how gravitational waves could change physics forever. Right next to each other. Where? Yeah. What other site's going to give you that? It's a good mix. It's a great mix. Yeah. yeah. How could you not want to scroll through that forever? <sighs> I'm going to book, I'm going to make you my homepage. There you go. Perfect. I don't want to miss a single, by the way. Okay, just real quickly, making a murderer. Did he do it or not? I'm uh, No spoiler. I'm not clicking on that. Oh, don't that. click oh, on that. Don't <laughs> click on <laughs> that. Oh! The hottest. I'm way through that. <laughs> the hottest Netflix uh, show ever. Uh, well, I have some strong opinions. We'll talk. Uh, and you don't have to worry about it because you're in Taiwan and you get Netflix, but you only get four movies. They all have Bruce Lee in them. <laughs> no, what well, they, they actually? Uh, I mean, I, I I've had Netflix for. There are ways to get Netflix. No, they're uh, going to crack down on it, dude. Did well, you see that? Um, well, they, they they yes. Well, they've cracked down on it before. Uh, to to varying degrees of success, oh, okay. but I think they're more motivated to now that they've launched. They officially launched in Taiwan as part right. of the 130 countries that they launched what, in Taiwan. What plus, movies plus uh, is it? A pretty good collection on uh, Netflix Taiwan. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I I, I mostly uh, I I subscribe for which I think is their goal for their shows. Right. Um. Uh, which uh, although they don't have in the U.S. House of Cards, um, or they don't have in Taiwan. Actually, what? they don't have. They don't have House of Cards in most markets. Uh -huh. uh, oh. Part of the reasons when they when they created it and one of the reasons they got off the ground was actually there was a joint deal where Sony Dana, actually kept the international uh, rights. Dana got and the so, rights, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they aired, it actually aired on TV in Taiwan uh, oh, a couple of years ago. Oh. Um, well, but, do you have to the make to make a murderer? Because that's a good one too. I I do. I but I haven't. I I. I <laughs> For me, signing up for things like uh, Netflix and HBO is mostly aspirational. Yeah. Someday um, I'll get to watch these, TV again. There's all these shows people talk about that I think <laughs> that I say I'm going to watch, and then I and then I don't. Yeah. You thought it was uh, a good idea to have your own business. Yeah. I'm I'm drastically behind on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll let you go because you got to go to work. Hey, thank you all three of you. Really a pleasure. Thanks to all of you for watching the show. We love. Uh, having you live because then you're in the chat room and I know you're out there and I could feel your presence. 3 p.m. Pacific, 7, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2300 UTC on Twit on Sundays. We also love having you in studio and a great studio audience today. We appreciate your coming. If you want to be in the studio audience, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's here. It's nice to see you with your wife, Priscilla. <laughs> great to see you. All you have to do, you do look a little bit like Mark. Has anybody ever told you that? No? All right. No. First one. Uh, just email tickets at twit.tv, and we'll make a, a seat out, uh, put a seat out there for you. Um, don't forget our newsletter, twit.tv slash newsletter. If you'd like to be in the know, the insider, get that regular weekly newsletter. We promise not to do anything else with your email address ever, ever, ever. I take that seriously. Um, and uh, tomorrow, Jonathan Haidt, going to be a great triangulation, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week. Another twit this is in the can. Bye-bye.